Shelley knew that Mrs. Winter was angry and that Mrs. Winter thought she did not appreciate others' good intentions. In everyone's eyes, she was eager to get close to Knox because she would be able to live comfortably for the rest of her life. She used to think that marrying Knox, becoming the young mistress of the Winters, and having a huge fortune was her biggest goal in life. However, after going through so much, she did not care about such a life at all. She would rather take Bella with her and live their little lives. She was just too disappointed in Knox. She even felt that she would never, in her life, change her opinion of him. Just think about it. Mrs. Winter left after saying that. Shelley stared at Mrs. Winter's back and did not say anything in the end. When Knox saw his mother walking out of the door angrily, he quickly went forward to stop her. Mom, why are you leaving? Because I don't want to stay here anymore. What's wrong? Did you and Shelley argue with each other? We didn't, but my feelings were hurt. Mrs. Winter did not want to hide it. I don't know what I did wrong by getting you and Shelley to get married and have children. Why did she have to reject me? Didn't Shelley always want to marry you? Now that she can marry you, she's trying to take advantage of us dash. Mom. Knox interrupted his mother as he could not stand her criticizing Shelley. Are you really trying to go against me? Mrs. Winter was furious. You never used to want to listen to anything nice I said about Shelley, but now that I'm criticizing her, you can't stand it? Are you trying to piss me off? Don't worry about us. Just go. Knox also urged her to leave. Mrs. Winter was really disappointed in her son. I'd like to see what you do about this. She waved her hand and left. After seeing his mother leave angrily, Knox quickly closed the door and ran to Shelley. Looking at her calm face, he said, You don't have to take what my mother said to heart. All right, Shelley replied indifferently as she was concentrating on what she was doing. If you want to get married at 25 or 26, I can wait. I'm not in a hurry anyway. Okay. Um, are you angry? Knox could not help but ask. No Shelley looked up at Knox. Are you afraid of making your mother angry? It's okay. She'll be fine in a while. Besides, getting married and having children is between the two of us. It has nothing to do with her. Don't think too much about it. Knox comforted her. All right. Shelley nodded. Do you want me to help you with anything? Knox asked. He was trying to please Shelley. There's no need. We can eat soon. Just carry Bella to the dining table and wait for me. All right. Knox quickly went to the living room and carried Bella to the dining table. Bella had become very dependent on Knox. Sometimes, she would even act like a spoilt child and sit in Knox's arms to get him to feed her. However, Shelley would tell Bella off for doing that every time because Knox would not be able to eat properly. Bella, return to your seat, Shelley said sternly as she served breakfast. Upon hearing that, Bella unhappily left Knox's embrace and sat on her chair. Then, Shelley served Bella her breakfast before placing her and Knox's breakfast on the dining table. It was very quiet at the dining table. Sometimes, Bella would speak to either Shelley or Knox, and some other times, Knox would be talking to Shelley. However, never once did Shelley start a conversation with Knox. As Knox ate his breakfast, he could feel Shelley's coldness toward him. She looked very obedient, but in fact, she was not friendly to him at all. He looked up at Shelley and watched as she lowered her head and ate her breakfast seriously, pretending not to see him staring at her. Unless he called her, she would pretend that she did not see it. Shelley. In the end, Knox called out to her. Shelley looked up and asked, Does it taste bad? Do you like me? Knox suddenly asked. Shelley was stunned for a second as she did not expect Knox to ask that question. The two of them had been living together for a month, but Knox had never asked about that. It was as if he did not care whether she liked him or not. Shelley's eyes flickered. Then, she lowered her head to eat her breakfast again and said, why are you asking this all of a sudden? It suddenly feels to me that you don't like me very much, Knox said sarcastically. Shelley did not answer, which meant she tacitly agreed with his statement. It turned out that Shelley really did not like him. He thought he would not care about whether Shelley liked him or not, but his heart hurt so much. After Mrs. Winter left Knox's apartment and went back to her private car, she was still angry. She found that Shelley had changed a lot and was seemingly much more independent than before. Back then, Shelley would listen to everything she said, but now, Shelley even had the nerve to reject her suggestion about them getting married and having children. At the end of the day, she was a little unhappy, especially since she had been looking forward to seeing grandchildren of her own for so many years. All the wealthy ladies around her already had grandchildren of their own. 
When Thu had dinner afternoon Tem and or Hendi appointments together they would talk about their fat grandchildren and obedient granddaughters. Although she said she was happy without grandchildren, she knew better than anyone how much she wanted one. Now, she really wished she had a baby in her arms, and the thought of it frustrated her even more. Hence, she realized she had to think of a way to get Knox and Shelley to get married soon and have a child. Suddenly, she lowered her head and looked at her phone, which was ringing. She glanced at the unknown caller and took a deep breath before answering the call. Hello. Auntie, I'm Zoe. Zoe's sobbing voice could be heard from the other end of the phone. Mrs. Winter's expression darkened immediately. She could not believe Zoe still had the cheek to call her. When she thought of what that woman had done to her son, she wanted to slap her to death. To think the dignified young master of the Winters had been toyed with by a woman to such an extent. Now, not only did that woman not stay away, but she even took the initiative to look for her. I don't want to receive your calls or see you ever again. Don't call me. It's useless to say anything to me now. I won't change my opinion of you, nor will I be soft-hearted. I might even hate you to the core I. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant with Knox's child, Zoe said emotionally. Mrs. Winter was stunned. The next second, she said righteously, you're saying it's Knox's child because you're pregnant? You cheated on Knox so many times back then. Who knows whose child you're pregnant with? It really is Knox's. It's been nearly four months now. Auntie, I found someone to do a gender test, and it's a boy. Zoe said miserably, I know you won't forgive me for what I did to Knox, but the child is innocent. Auntie, the child is a. Winter. Mrs. Winter was swayed by Zoe's words. Zoe could also feel the change in Mrs. Winter's emotions and quickly said, Auntie, don't worry. I won't pester Knox. After all, I don't have the right to be with Knox anymore. The reason for my call is to tell you that I'm pregnant with Knox's child. I want to give birth to it, but with my current financial situation, I can't take good care of him or give him enough nutrition, so my only choice is to come to you. I've also made up my mind. When I give birth to the child, I'll hand the child over to you and leave Knox. I won't make things difficult for you. I just want to give birth to this child. Don't lie to me. Mrs. Winter was still in disbelief. Auntie, science is so advanced now that we can do a paternity test. If you don't believe me, you can arrange for me to do a paternity test. I can do it right now. Zoe quickly said. It was safe to say that Mrs. Winter was skeptical about it. How about this, auntie? Let's meet and have a good talk. If you still don't believe me, I won't disturb you anymore. Zoe's voice sounded like she was choking. Mrs. Winter knew she should not trust Zoe so easily and that she would never forgive that woman, but when it came to children. At the thought of how Shelley had rejected her today, she felt inexplicably angry. As such, she gave Zoe an address where Zoe could wait for her. Zoe immediately agreed, and Mrs. Winter also headed to that address. As she was not far away by car, she arrived first. After waiting in the private room for almost half an hour, Mrs. Winter ran out of patience, and only then was Zoe led in by the staff. The moment Zoe entered, Mrs. Winter thought she had seen wrongly. What? Had Zoe, who was originally glamorous and beautiful, gone through in just a few months to end up like that? Zoe looked extremely old, and if she did not know it was Zoe, she would have thought that she was a forty-year-old lady. Zoe looked at Mrs. Winter's gaze and lowered her head in shame. You probably didn't expect me to end up like this, did you? You deserve it. Mrs. Winter was not soft-hearted. Zoe only had herself to blame. Yes, I deserve it. I never expected you would pity me or sympathize with me. If it weren't for the child in my stomach and if I didn't want to give birth to him, I wouldn't have come to you. As Zoe spoke, she could not help but cry miserably. Mrs. Winter watched as Zoe cried miserably. She held it in and said, All right, stop crying. If you have something to say, just say it. Don't cry. It's annoying. Auntie. Zoe wiped her tears, looking very pitiful. Sit down, Mrs. Winter called out. Zoe sat in front of Mrs. Winter, looking a little reserved. Auntie, I'm really pregnant with Knox's son. It's been more than four months now, and I've been in hiding every day because Knox wants to abort it. However, I can't bear to kill a life. Knox knows? Mrs. Winter raised her eyebrows. He knows. I told him as soon as I found out I was pregnant. I thought he was as compassionate as I was, but I didn't expect him to tell me to abort it. It wasn't easy for me to sneak out, and I haven't dared to go back to look for my parents. I've been hiding in the city with not much money left. I'm barely surviving on the money I got from selling my jewelry and bags. It's fine if I can't survive, but I don't want to mistreat the baby. 
He's really innocent. Zoe started to wail again, which made Mrs. Winter a little impatient. However, when she remembered that Zoe was pregnant, she reluctantly endured it. Is it really Knox's child? Mrs. Winter asked. It's true. We can go to the hospital for a checkup now, Zoe said with determination. Mrs. Winter thought about it for a moment and decided to confirm it. Hence, she brought Zoe to the hospital. When it was their turn, the doctor said seriously, amniocentesis has a certain probability of affecting the baby. In other words, it might cause the pregnant woman to miscarry. When Mrs. Winter heard that, she was a little hesitant. Is there a high chance of miscarriage? Zoe asked emotionally. It's not high, but there are precedents of such cases, so we don't approve of DNA testing during the fetal period. Of course, if you insist on doing it, we can also perform the test according to the normal procedures. However, before the test, you need to sign a contract on acknowledging the risks of doing it. What contract? Mrs. Winter asked. It's for risk avoidance. To put it bluntly, if the pregnant woman unexpectedly miscarries after the amniocentesis, the hospital won't be responsible for it. Mrs. Winter fell silent, and Zoe could tell that Mrs. Winter was hesitant. She quickly said, it's okay. I believe that won't happen to us. The doctor just said that the chances aren't high. The chance is not high, but if it happens to an individual, the chances of miscarrying is definite. You should think about it carefully, the doctor emphasized again. It was because he knew that if anything happened, the hospital could not bear such a huge responsibility for such a VIP client, so he was also trying his best to persuade them not to do the test. Yes, if the fetus is in any danger, I will bear the responsibility. Zoe was very determined. Mrs. Winter, on the other hand, was not so determined, and her expression was a little ugly. You'll bear the responsibility, huh? What if it's my grandson? How are you going to bear the responsibility then? But, Zoe looked troubled. How will you know the child is Knox's without the test? I don't want to make things difficult for you. Even if something happens to the fetus in the end, I'll admit it. I'll also dash. Enough. Mrs. Winter raised her voice a little. I believe you. She believed Zoe would not lie to her after all that she had done. Zoe bit her lip. At that moment, she was so touched that she said excitedly, Thank you. Thank you. Don't thank me yet. We'll know if it's Knox's child or not after the child is born. Mrs. Winter's expression was cold. Yes, yes, yes. We'll know when the child is born, Zoe quickly said. All right, let's go. Mrs. Winter exited the hospital with Zoe. As Zoe sat quietly in Mrs. Winter's car, Mrs. Winter asked, Where are you staying now? Zoe remained quiet. Where do you live? I'll send you back now. I'm staying at a hostel. Where is it? Mrs. Winter asked impatiently. Zoe told her the address, and Mrs. Winter told the driver to drive to the location. Looking at the hostel in front of her, which was dirty, old, and had a terrible environment, Mrs. Winter said with disdain, Is this where you live? I've always lived here. Zoe nodded. Forget it. I'll get a room in a hotel for you. Mrs. Winter could not stand it anymore. Do you have anything to pack? What else do I have? I've sold everything I could. In that case, get in the car. Mrs. Winter did not want to waste any time. Zoe followed Mrs. Winter into the car, and Mrs. Winter then brought Zoe to the best hotel in Southampton City. When they checked in, Zoe was a little hesitant. What's wrong? Mrs. Winter asked her. I was afraid Knox would find me and drag me to get an abortion again. So, to avoid Knox's eyes, I had to live in those places. Knox would never have thought that I would live in that kind of hostel, Zoe explained. Mrs. Winter thought about it and realized Zoe's worries made sense. Someone as stupid as Knox could really do anything. She said, let's go. I'll buy you a house. Auntie, Zoe was surprised. If the child is Knox's, you deserve it. Mrs. Winter said calmly, the Winters will not mistreat you. Thank you, Auntie. Without being too friendly, Mrs. Winter drove Zoe to the newest building and bought Zoe a luxury apartment that was ready to move in. Not only that, but Mrs. Winter also bought Zoe clothes and skincare products. She even hired a nanny for Zoe. Before she left, she gave Zoe $2,000 for expenses and told Zoe she could ask for more when she ran out. Zoe was so grateful that she cried as she sent Mrs. Winter off. After that, she looked at the spacious house and brand new furniture, feeling excited. If she had known that Mrs. Winter was so easy to talk to, she would have come to look for her earlier. Then, she would not have had to suffer so much. She quickly picked up her phone and called her parents. 
Dad, Mom, I'll give you an address. You can move in. Did you succeed? The other party asked excitedly. It worked. When Mrs. Winter found out that I was pregnant with Knox's child, she immediately bought me a house, clothes, and a nanny. All right, we'll be right there. However, Zoe, if we lie to Mrs. Winter like this, we'll lose everything once we're exposed. The other parties expressed their worries. I didn't lie to her. I may not know if the child is Knox's, but what if it is? Zoe retorted. Indeed, she did not know if the child was Knox's because after sleeping with Knox, she had also slept with many other people. However, it should be Knox's, but she could not care less. If she did not get the Winters to give her some money, she would not be able to survive. Today, she had gotten Mrs. Winter to go to the hospital with her for a checkup because she knew that Mrs. Winter would definitely not be willing to risk a miscarriage for an amniocentesis. Fortunately, she did manage to get away with it. But what if it isn't? Don't you know how cruel Knox is to us? If you lie to him again, he will kill us. Don't worry, I won't let this child be born. I'm just trying to swindle a sum of money. Zoe said bluntly, now that I'm sure that Mrs. Winter wants the child in my belly, I'll use Mrs. Winter to negotiate with Knox. As long as Knox gives me a sum of money, I'll abort the child. Then, with money, our family will be able to live for the rest of our lives. That's the only way, the other party quickly echoed. I've had enough of this hard life. Quick. Come over. All right. When Zoe hung up, her eyes narrowed. She did not want to lie to Knox, but Knox was just too cruel. If not for the fact that she could not survive anymore, she would not have dared to threaten Knox. This time, she had thought it through. All she wanted was money, and as long as Knox gave her money, she would stop pestering him. Knox had not been in a good mood recently. Ever since he found out that Shelley did not like him, he had been feeling upset. How else could he make Shelley like him? It was really hard for him to think of ways he could do that. He had always found Shelley to be stubborn, and she could turn a blind eye to whatever he did. While he sat there in the office, feeling frustrated, the phone rang. Knox picked up. What's the matter? The person opposite him took a deep breath and could tell that Knox was in a bad mood. Speak. Knox raised his voice. Mr. Winter, we found Zoe, the other party said in fear. Knox had almost forgotten about that person. We couldn't find her before, but now, we found her in a luxury apartment. The other party quickly said, she is still pregnant with the child. What? Knox stood up from his office chair. What have you been doing? Didn't I tell you to get her to have an abortion? How is she still pregnant? We were searching for her for a long time, but we couldn't find her. It was as if she had suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth. Moreover, there was a time when we were distracted from helping you pursue Miss Carter, so we didn't have the energy to look for her, the other party explained. All right, all right. I don't want to hear all those excuses. Take Zoe for the abortion now and let me know when it's done. I don't want to waste my time on her. Knox ordered impatiently. Young Master Winter, I've seen your mother frequenting Zoe's residence. The other party reported, after some investigation, we found out that your mother bought the luxury apartment that Zoe is living in, and she is now taking care of everything. It seems like your mother knows about Zoe's pregnancy. Damn it. Knox cursed. He did not want it to alarm his family because he knew it would be very troublesome once they found out. He also knew how much his mother wanted a grandchild right now, so she definitely would not allow Zoe to abort the child. Mr. Winter, we're afraid of causing conflict with the old lady, so we want to ask for your opinion, the other party asked carefully. Knox thought about it before saying, come and pick me up. I'll go see Zoe myself. Okay, I'll come and pick you up immediately. The other party heaved a sigh of relief. Then, Knox immediately left the office. If that matter was not resolved, it would be a ticking time bomb. To him, Zoe was completely out of his life, and he did not even want to look at her, much less let her threaten him. Knox quickly rushed to Zoe's luxury apartment and knocked on her door roughly. Boom! 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 It took a long time before it was opened. As soon as Zoe opened it and saw Knox, she panicked. Knox, I, don't say a word. I'm disgusted. Come with me to the hospital now, or don't blame me for being rude to you. Knox grabbed Zoe's hand and prepared to leave. No, I won't go even if I die. Knox, I beg you, don't treat me like this. Please. Zoe wailed and resisted. At that moment, Zoe's parents ran out of their house and stopped Knox from leaving with Zoe. Knox, no matter what, the child is innocent. Aren't you taking it too far? Now that Zoe isn't bothering you, what else do you want from her? 
Zoe's father berated him. Knox sneered. The child is innocent? It's precisely because the child is innocent that it shouldn't suffer. I'm afraid the child will be despised for having such a SL asterisk TTY mother. Enough. Even if my daughter has done something wrong, who are you to say that about her? Do you think you're a good person? Haven't you fooled around with a lot of women? What right do you have to judge my daughter? At least my daughter has compassion for all life. You're worse than a beast. Zoe's father roared. Knox glanced at him and did not take him seriously at all. He said to the two men beside him, stop them. Yes. The two men quickly went forward to grab Zoe's parents, wanting to drag them away. Zoe's parents resisted while cursing at Knox, and Zoe, who was frightened, kept resisting as well. However, she could not break free from Knox's hold and was dragged directly to the elevator. When the elevator doors opened, Mrs. Winter stepped out from inside and was infuriated to see the scene before her. Knox, let go of them. What are you doing? Knox held back a little when he saw his mother, but he did not let go. He said bluntly, taking Zoe to get an abortion. Are you crazy? Mrs. Winter was so angry that she wanted to push Knox's hand away. However, Knox grabbed Zoe's arm even harder. Tears streamed down Zoe's face. It hurts. It hurts. Let go. Mrs. Winter shouted. She was so angry that her voice cracked. It's none of your business, Knox said firmly. He tightened his grip on Zoe. Knox, if leave with Zoe, I'll kill myself right here and now. Mrs. Winter threatened. Knox immediately stopped what he was doing. Mrs. Winter was so angry that she slammed herself into the wall beside her. Mom. Knox was shocked. He quickly let go of Zoe and ran over to support Mrs. Winter, who pretended to be dizzy and leaned into Knox's arms unsteadily. Mom, are you crazy? Knox yelled. It took a long time for Mrs. Winter to regain her senses. Then, she looked at Knox and said weakly. Knox, if you take Zoe for an abortion, I mean what I say. I will die in front of you, and it is not a threat. What are you thinking? How can you guarantee that the child in Zoe's stomach is mine? Knox was a little angry. If it's not yours, why are you aborting it? Mrs. Winter asked. Knox was rendered speechless by his mother. I don't care. I don't care what personal grudges you have with Zoe, but I want the grandson in Zoe's belly. Can you quit being so foolish? Have you ever thought about what Zoe did to Meg Anna you still want na to give dirt to a nilak do you want tna kna to dislike? The child is innocent and shouldn't be involved in your conflict. Do you think murderers are not qualified to have children? Would their children die with them when they were born? Mom. Knox could not stand how unreasonable Mrs. Winter was. Anyway, I want the child in Zoe's belly. No matter what, I won't let you abort it. It's not like I don't have a child. Why do you have to insist on having the one in Zoe's belly? Knox was furious. If you want grandchildren, I can get Shelley to give birth to them. Zoe isn't the only one who can give birth to your grandchildren. Shelley told me that she won't marry you and have your children for the time being. It's only temporary. Knox, don't blame me for being direct, but Shelley doesn't like you at all. After all that you've done to Shelley, or even if it were any other woman, she wouldn't have a good impression of you. I know Shelley's personality too well. She's a stubborn person. Once she's set her mind on something, she won't change it. I don't know why Shelley agreed to get back together with you, but I don't think she'll have your child so easily, and I don't want to give myself false hope. Mrs. Winter said indignantly. However, the child in Zoe's belly will be my grandson soon, and I'll never allow you to abort it. Can you let me settle my own matters and let me deal with my child? You always interfere in my matters, and it pisses me off. I didn't like Shelley back then, but you insisted that I be with Shelley. And now that I don't want Zoe's child, you insist on me keeping it. Can't you just let me handle it myself? Didn't you make a mess of it that one time I told you to deal with it yourself? Take Shelley as an example. If you would have listened to us and gotten together with Shelley back then, you wouldn't be in your current situation. You regret it now, don't you? That's why you have to listen to me this time. Otherwise, you might fall into Shelley's hands in the future and never have a child of your own for the rest of your life. Mrs. Winter was very sure. I can go with your decision regarding anything else, but I won't compromise on the child in Zoe's belly. Knox was very determined. I can go with your decision regarding anything else, but I have to have this child. Mrs. Winter was also very determined. The mother and son were at loggerheads, neither giving in. Mom, do you think Shelley and I can still be together after Zoe gives birth to the child? Knox said sadly. Were they not supposed to date, get married, and then have children? Why was it so complicated? 
Why did the whole process of getting married and having children look so smooth for Edward and Finn but so difficult for him? What's there to be unhappy about? Doesn't Shelley also have a child? It's fair now. How is that the same? Shelley's child isn't hers. You can pretend that this child isn't yours. I'll take care of it. How can you be so unreasonable? I'm not being unreasonable. I'm just telling you, Knox, that I have to have Zoe's child. Don't argue with me. I won't compromise even if it means I have to die, Mrs. Winter said fiercely. That statement infuriated Knox. Knox, I'm not trying to make things difficult for you. If you had listened to me back then, your child would have been the same age as Bella, and I wouldn't be forcing it on you right now. Mrs. Winter's voice softened when she saw that Knox was upset. Knox did not understand what his mother meant, so he ignored her. However, Mrs. Winter explained, Shelley had a miscarriage during the car accident. Knox froze and looked straight at Mrs. Winter. I didn't tell you because I knew you were determined not to be with Shelley. Only Shelley and I know about this. So, Knox, if you want Shelley to fall in love with you, marry you, and have children with you, it won't be easy. I'm just thinking about your future. You're not young anymore, and it's not a good idea for you to wait. If you get Zoe to keep the child, you can do whatever you want with Shelley. I will support you. Knox did not hear what his mother said after that. The only thing on his mind was Shelley's miscarriage. He cursed at himself, wondering what he had done to Shelley back then. He was worse than a beast. Knox fell silent for a long time, and Mrs. Winter could not bear to see her son like that. Having calmed down a lot, she said earnestly, Knox, don't make things difficult for Shelley anymore. Actually, letting Zoe give birth to the child is good for both of you. Think about it, why would Shelley rather raise Bella than bear your child? Isn't it because she doesn't want to give birth to your child? Knox's eyes were a little red, and he was not convinced by his mother. Instead, he thought of everything he had done in the past. Why did he not visit Shelley after she got into a car accident? If they met and found out that they had a child together, he did not know if his heart would have softened. All right, don't be too sad. It's all in the past. In the future, you and Shelley will have a good life. Just make sure to spoil her more and make it up to her. In the meantime, let Zoe give birth to this child, and I will raise it for you. I won't stop you, young people, from being together, and I promise I won't rush you and Shelley to have a child anymore. Then, you can live your own life. Mrs. Winter consoled. Knox adjusted his emotions and said to his mother, If Shelley doesn't give birth to a child for me, I won't have a child for the rest of my life. Knox. Mrs. Winter, who had finally calmed down, flew off the handle again. Consider me unfilial, Knox said coldly. If you abort the child in Zoe's belly, I will die in front of you, Mrs. Winter threatened again. Knox pretended not to hear her and said, I'll give you two days to think about it. Two days later, I will take Zoe for an abortion. Mom, don't even think about taking Zoe away. I can find her anywhere she goes. With that, he left. Mrs. Winter stared at Knox's back with an ugly expression. She could not understand why Knox was so stubborn. It was the same back when he was not with Shelley and now that he was with Shelley. Why was he so unreasonable? While Mrs. Winter was so angry that her body was trembling, Zoe was very calm as she had expected that outcome. Therefore, she had never thought that she would give birth to the child. Moreover, if the child was not Knox's, she would die a more miserable death after she gave birth to it. However, on the surface, she pretended to be afraid about Knox wanting to abort the child. She sobbed and said, Auntie, what should we do? Knox is a man of his word. Would I not be able to keep the baby? Calm down. Mrs. Winter, who was also furious at that moment, roared at Zoe. Then, she thought about it before saying to Zoe, All right, you stay at home. I'll think of a way. She figured that although there was nothing she could do to change Knox's mind, there was old Master Winter, who was very strict with Knox. As long as Grandpa Winter allowed Zoe to give birth to the child, she would definitely be able to do so. With that thought in mind, Mrs. Winter left in a hurry, and Zoe's expression changed as soon as she saw Mrs. Winter leave. Zoe's parents quickly pulled Zoe and asked, Zoe, what should we do now? Everything is going as planned, Zoe said coldly. I'll talk to Knox later. Will he be threatened by you? Of course. Zoe said with certainty, Knox may look carefree and heartless, but he's actually very loyal. He'd rather keep things peaceful than let his family suffer. However. What? Zoe's father was feeling restless. Were Knox and his mother talking about Shelley? Are Knox and Shelley together? Zoe was surprised. She never thought that Knox would end up with Shelley. 
Knowing how much Shelley hated Knox and how much Knox hated Shelley, somehow, she felt angry. She did not expect Shelley to take advantage of her in the end. Knox returned home before it was time for him to get off work. When he opened the door and walked into the room, Shelley, who was playing with Bella in the living room, was beaming with joy. However, when she saw him, her expression froze, and the smile in her eyes seemed to disappear. A moment later, she smiled at him politely and said, You're back so early today. Don't you have to go to work? Do you really want me to go to work? Knox asked. No, it's just a little strange that you're home so early, Shelley said indifferently. Knox just looked at her. Shelley pretended not to see him looking at her and continued to play with Bella. The two of them were sitting on the floor, having a good time. After being ignored for a while, Knox walked over and sat on the mat. Shelley looked up and glanced at Knox without much emotion, but Bella, on the other hand, was much friendlier to him. She held the Barbie doll in her hand and asked happily, Uncle, is my doll cute? It's cute. Knox smiled at Bella. I picked the clothes for the Barbie doll. Bella was trying to show off her skills. You have good taste, Bella. Knox stroked her head, his voice filled with affection. Uncle, do you like any of these clothes? I'll change Barbie into them. Having been praised, Bella's entire face lit up with joy, and she quickly took out all of Barbie's clothes for Knox to pick. After Knox carefully picked out an outfit, Bella said, Uncle, I'll change her outfit in a bit. All right. Uncle, close your eyes, Bella said to him in her tender voice. Why? Because Barbie is a girl. Boys can't watch girls change. Bella had a serious look on her face. All right. Knox nodded. W-I-T-N na, an eternia ms dactina, on a bima degan to nange barm s c tentnes with her small hands. At the same time, Shelley looked at Knox's back before slowly getting up to leave. Knox could sense Shelley leaving. However, he could also sense Shelley's distance from him. It was probably because she was disappointed and did not like him that she was avoiding him. All done, Bella said to Knox. The moment Knox turned around, the gloominess on his face instantly disappeared and a smile appeared on his face. Shelley glanced over for a moment before she looked away again. In fact, she found that Knox had changed a lot. He used to hate children with a passion, but now, he could play with Bella. After that, she walked into the kitchen and started preparing dinner. Although it was still early, she started to mess around in the kitchen because she did not want to be with Knox. While she was focused on preparing the dinner for tonight, Knox suddenly walked in. Shelley pursed her lips, and Knox noticed the stiffness on her lips. He said, Do you want me to help you? No need. You can play with Bella, Shelley refused. Bella wants to watch some TV for a while. Then, you should rest and play some games, Shelley suggested. Do you not like me getting close to you? Knox suddenly asked. Shelley bit her lip and shook her head slowly. No. Shelley, it's easy for me to believe you. And if you say no, I will believe it. Knox looked at her seriously. Shelley paused and raised her head to meet Knox's gaze. She said, By helping me, you're actually giving me more things to do, so why don't you just stand at the side obediently? It'll make my life easier. Upon hearing that, Knox frowned. Every time you help me with washing and chopping the vegetables, you'll dirty the stove. You even cut your finger the last time you chopped the vegetables. And because your knife skills weren't great, I had to cut it again, Shelley said bluntly. Feeling a little embarrassed, Knox said, I can learn. No need. I can take care of things at home. Anyway, I have nothing to do all day, so just do your job well. Knox did not know what to say. He thought Shelley had always spoken to him calmly to keep the peace between them. However, he also felt that she was deliberately pushing him away. If you have to help, peel the garlic for me. I'm making garlic prawns tonight, Shelley suddenly said. Okay, Knox replied. Shelley gave Knox some garlic and taught him how to peel them. Knox took it very seriously and was careful not to make a mess in the kitchen this time. Shelley looked at Knox, who was squatting beside the trash can on the ground. Seeing that he looked a little tired, she was slightly touched. After all, she had dreamt that Knox would help her with such a thing one day. She took a small stool that Bella often sat on from the living room and handed it to Knox. You can sit down. Squatting can be tiring. Knox was startled by Shelley's voice. He was afraid Shelley would dislike him if he did not do it well, so he was very focused on the task, and Shelley's sudden voice almost scared him to death. At that moment, the knife in his hand that he was using to peel the garlic suddenly cut into his hand, and blood oozed out. Knox immediately covered it up as he did not want Shelley to see it. 
After all, Shelley had just complained that he either had bad knife skills or was prone to cut his finger. Now, he had cut his finger again. Is it bleeding? Shelley asked. It's nothing. It's just a small injury. I used to get injured a lot, so it's nothing, Knox quickly said. Let me bandage it for you. There's no need to bandage such a small injury. It'll be fine in a while. Knox. I'm fine. Don't worry about me, Knox urged, not wanting Shelley to look down on him. Shelley was a little speechless. In that case, clean the wound. If the garlic touches the wound, it will hurt even more. I said it doesn't hurt anymore, so go do your own thing. Knox was starting to get impatient. Shelley was used to Knox's temper and also knew that no one could change his mind. Hence, she stood up from the ground and said, in that case, you clean your wound yourself. All right. When Knox saw that Shelley had walked away and was doing her own thing, he stood up and cleaned the wound himself under the tap water. Shelley glanced over. In the end, she could not bear to see him struggle anymore and went to the first aid kit to find a band-aid. After Knox cleaned the wound and wiped it dry, she handed Knox a band-aid. Put it on. Knox glanced at Shelley and slowly took it. After Shelley went back to her work, Knox lowered his head and started putting on the band-aid, which was inconvenient to put on with one hand. Shelley went over again and took the band-aid. Give me your finger. Under Shelley's insistence, Knox extended his finger, and Shelley carefully put on the band-aid on Knox's finger. Meanwhile, Knox kept looking at Shelley, watching her serious expression. He said, I don't seem to be able to do anything right. Shelley paused for a moment before saying, everyone has their own strengths. You don't have to do everything well. At the very least, you're very good at doing business, and many people can't compare to you when it comes to that. Are you trying to comfort me? I'm telling the truth. Shelley said as she held the band-aid, take me, for example. I won't know how to work in a company, but I can be a waitress. Shelley's tone was normal, but Knox felt an indescribable sense of guilt when he heard it. If Shelley had been able to pass the college entrance examination and Leveritex R, he could not help but ask, back then, your car accident. I'm talking about the car accident that happened on the day of your college entrance examination. Were your injuries serious? Shelley did not know why Knox was suddenly bringing up the car accident. At that time, Knox would rather die than visit her in the hospital, and she figured that was when she had completely given up on Knox. When she was lying on the hospital bed, the doctor told her that she had a miscarriage, even before she knew about the existence of the child. He also told her that she was disfigured. Since she was not good-looking, to begin with, she would probably not be able to be in public anymore with her disfigured face. That time was the lowest point of her life. In fact, she had hoped that Knox would come to see her and agree to be with her, even if it was because he felt sorry for her. However, in the end, Knox was not that kind. As the days passed and Knox was nowhere to be seen, she was left utterly disappointed. Later, she heard from Mrs. Winter that Knox had gotten into a fight with Grandpa Winter because he did not want to see her and was beaten half to death by Grandpa Winter. Seeing that Mrs. Winter had told her to spare Knox's life, she let him go. After taking Knox's money, she wanted to never see Knox again, and she did indeed keep her dignity. Even though there was a time when she compromised because of Bella, she still managed to pull through it. Just when she thought she had gotten used to her current life, Knox suddenly appeared out of nowhere, and she did not know how many more years she would have to endure. She put on the band-aid and said to Knox, it's done. Seeing that she did not answer his question, he gulped and swallowed the words he wanted to say. He really wanted to apologize to her and the child they had lost. However, in the face of Shelley's indifference, Knox held his tongue. He watched as Shelley, whose attitude toward him had been lukewarm, turned around and went back to doing her own thing. Hence, Knox silently sat on the bench and continued peeling garlic. In the kitchen, no one spoke again, and it was quiet. After dinner, Shelley would shower Bella and put Bella to bed before returning to her room. Usually, Knox would lie on the sofa and watch TV or play games while waiting for her, and it was the same tonight. The moment Knox took out his phone and was about to play a game, his phone suddenly rang. Knox looked at a familiar phone number and answered the call. Hello. Knox, it's me, Zoe. Knox's expression changed immediately. When he was about to hang up, he heard her say, I know you don't want to answer my call, but I just want to tell you that I don't mind getting an abortion. Knox's eyes narrowed. What tricks are you playing now? I admit that I have a motive, but I have no choice. Knox, I'm downstairs. Zoe hung up the phone after that. Knox gritted his teeth and rushed out of the house at lightning speed.
Shelley had just coaxed Bella to sleep and opened the door to see Knox leaving the house anxiously. She did not know what he was up to, but without him around, she could relax a little. Hence, she returned to her room and did her own thing. The moment Knox walked downstairs, he saw Zoe standing under a street lamp and waiting for him alone from afar. He walked up to her and said, Tell me, what do you want? Knox, was our relationship nothing to you? The child in my stomach is yours. Zoe was a little unhappy when she saw Knox's cold-blooded appearance. Let me ask you again, what do you want? Knox did not have much patience with Zoe. Zoe held it in. She also knew that if Knox said he could ignore her, he would. She said bluntly, I don't mind aborting the child. In fact, I can even tell your mother that the child is not yours, but I want some money. Then, I'll make sure there won't be any conflict between you and your mother. Tell me your purpose. Knox did not want to waste any time. Zoe said, I want a sum of money. Knox just stared at her. You know I'm short of money. I admit that I kept the child at first because I wanted to get back together with you. Although I messed around with a lot of men, you were the only one I liked the most, and I did want to be with you again. However, after seeing how cruel and cold-blooded you were to me, I gave up. Since we can't get back together, I don't want to use the child to tie you down, and it's unfair on the child. I don't want him to be born fatherless either. Zoe made things clear. However, I'm still pregnant with your child, and I've suffered so much. Even if I was wrong in the past, I've paid it all off with this child, and I don't owe you anything. That's why I'm asking you for money. How much do you want? Knox asked. It was so straightforward that even Zoe was surprised. She thought that Knox would at least reject her. After all, Knox could never be threatened. Fortunately, she was right about Knox not wanting to have any conflict with his parents. She said, one million dollars. Knox frowned slightly. Seeing the change in his expression, Zoe quickly said, Knox, you destroyed our business and made us lose tens of millions of dollars, so what's wrong with me taking back one million dollars? That is the least I'm willing to accept. If it's anything lower than this, we'll have to have a proper talk. I know I can't resist you and will lose the child sooner or later, but I guarantee I'll ruin your relationship with your mother. I'll give it to you. Knox suddenly agreed. However, Zoe did not believe him. I'm not threatened by you. I just don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Knox said, I'm afraid of Shelley misunderstanding the situation. Zoe's expression darkened. She could not help but ask, Are you together with Shelley? Didn't you say you disliked her? Didn't you hated her to the core? That's none of your business. Knox, you're hilarious, Zoe mocked. Have you said enough? Knox's expression was ugly. I suddenly realize that you're no better than me. Zoe sneered. I guess Shelley will never fall in love with you. Knox looked at Zoe coldly, and Zoe pursed her lips, gloating. She said, I'll go for an abortion tomorrow, but I need you to come with me. I need the best doctor. I can't hurt my body. All right. Knox agreed. Also, before the abortion tomorrow, I want to see $500,000 in my account. You can give me the other $500,000 after the abortion. I'll send you the account number later. Zoe stated her conditions. Anything else? Knox looked impatient. Zoe was still unhappy with Knox's attitude toward her. He used to treat her so well back then, but now, he had turned hostile. After Knox discussed the negotiations with Zoe, he turned around and left. He wanted nothing to do with that woman for even a second. When he returned home, Shelley had already returned to her room and was lying on the bed reading a book. Seeing saw Knox's return, Shelley said calmly, You're back. At the fact that she would never ask where he went, Knox pursed his lips and nodded. Then, he walked straight into the bathroom to take a shower. The moment the bathroom door closed, Shelley looked up. She had gone to the balcony to get some fresh air, so she saw Knox and Zoe discussing something under a street lamp. However, she did not care, so she came in from the balcony and lay on the bed. Based on her understanding of Knox, he would not be soft-hearted toward Zoe, and she believed she knew better than anyone else how cruel Knox was. Just like that, Shelley continued to read her book. After taking a shower, Knox went to the balcony to smoke and make a phone call. I just sent you an account. Transfer $500,000 to it. Yes. Arrange a good abortion doctor. I'll take Zoe for an abortion tomorrow. Yes. Come and pick me up tomorrow morning. Yes. With that, Knox hung up the phone. The most important thing now was for him to get rid of Zoe. Keeping her alive would ultimately be a disaster. By the time he put out the remaining cigarette butt and returned to his room, Shelley was already asleep. However, she had left a dim light on Knox's side. 
Knox lay on the bed, turned off the lights, and approached Shelley. Shelley knew that Knox had a strong need in certain aspects. If he had been able to hold it in back then, he would not have slept with her, and it was the same now. They would do it almost every night, and she was used to dealing with him. As long as he took the initiative, she would accept it passively. Having said that, Knox seemed a little different tonight. For once, he was actually keeping his hands to himself as he hugged her. Shelley did not know why he was suddenly behaving himself. Was it because of Zoe? Was he still reluctant to part with Zoe? That was true. Other than Zoe, no other woman had been by Knox's side for such a long time. If Zoe had not done such a terrible thing, Knox would have married Zoe, and they would have a happy family together. Suddenly, she felt a little disappointed. How did Zoe get caught at the last moment? If only Zoe had not been caught, Knox would still be in love with Zoe, and she could live her own life. While Shelley was deep in her thoughts, she suddenly heard Knox say in her ear, Shelley, why don't we have a child together? Shelley's body tensed up, and she turned to look at Knox. Knox explained, my mom is rushing me. Oh, Shelley replied. She neither agreed nor rejected the idea. She seemed used to silently resisting everything Knox said. Go to sleep. Knox turned around, his back facing Shelley. As Shelley felt Knox turning away from her, for some reason, a mix of emotions welled up in her. She did not know if Knox had changed a lot during this time or if she had changed her mind, but Knox's disappointment made her feel inexplicably guilty. However, it was really difficult for her to compromise. In fact, she had never even thought about giving birth to Knox's child. She had an instinctive feeling that Knox was acting on a whim. The thought that he could suddenly become that playboy again one day scared her. In the quiet night, Knox tossed and turned, finding it hard to fall asleep. On one hand, it was because Shelley rejected him, on the other, he was thinking about taking Zoe to get an abortion tomorrow. Early the next morning, Shelley woke up to see that Knox was gone. It was a little strange as Knox had never left so early since they moved in together. Nevertheless, Shelley stretched and decided to lie down for a while. She felt more comfortable without Knox by her side. Knox left the house, sat in the car, and dialed Zoe's number. Knox dash. Come downstairs in ten minutes. I'll wait for you at the door. After saying that, he hung up the phone. Zoe looked at the words call ended, and her expression turned ugly. She was unhappy at how cold Knox was to her. Zoe, are you going to go with Knox? Zoe's father asked, still a little worried. Will Knox trick you? No, once Knox promises something, he will definitely do it. I received $500,000 from him last night, and after the abortion today, Knox will pay me the other $500,000. Don't worry, Dad, Zoe replied. Do you want us to go with you? No need. Just wait for me at home, Zoe said bluntly. Take care of yourself. Zoe's parents reminded her. All right. With that, Zoe opened the door and went downstairs. After waiting at the gate for a few minutes, a luxurious black car stopped beside Zoe. As soon as Zoe opened the car door and got in, the first thing she saw was Knox's cold face. Hence, she pursed her lips and held her tongue. The car soon arrived at Southampton City Central Hospital, and Zoe was directly assigned to a ward for a preoperative examination. Knox sat in the ward with her without saying a word as if the two of them were strangers. Around 10 a.m., the results of all the tests were out, and the medical staff brought Zoe to the operating theater. When they were leaving, Zoe could not help but ask Knox, will you regret it? Knox glanced at Zoe. What do you think? He's your flesh and blood, after all. Don't you feel guilty at all? Zoe gritted her teeth and asked. She had had enough of Knox's indifference toward her. I don't think so. Knox said coldly, after all, you're the one who's carrying my child. Knox, I hope you die with no children. Zoe left the ward with the doctor after saying those vicious words. Then, Knox told his subordinates to go with them while he waited in the ward. What Zoe said about hoping he died without any children kept replaying in his mind, and he felt that Zoe was right. As he took out a cigarette and walked to the balcony to smoke, he realized he was not as indifferent about killing his own flesh and blood as he thought. His hand that was smoking seemed to be trembling slightly. At 11 a.m., Zoe had yet to return. Did they not say that it would end in half an hour? Knox could not help but call his subordinate. Why isn't it over yet? I just heard from the operating theater that Zoe seems to be suffering from a major hemorrhage. Currently, they need to remove her uterus, but Zoe has refused to sign the papers for her uterus to be removed. I've just informed Zoe's parents to come over and sign it. Damn it. Knox cursed. 
he quickly threw away the cigarette butt and ran to the operating theater. He arrived just as Zoe's parents arrived as well. When Zoe's parents heard that her uterus had to be cut out, they cried in fear. Neither of them dared to sign the paper. However, the doctor said that if the uterus were not removed, Zoe would die. As a last resort, Zoe's father signed the contract with tears in his eyes. Once the paper was signed, the doctor quickly went in to perform the surgery. The only sound in the entire corridor was Zoe's parents' heart-wrenching cries. Knox, who was standing at the side, was a little saddened by how the situation had turned out. The moment Zoe's father saw Knox, he got so angry that he suddenly stepped forward and threw a punch. Knox did not dodge and took the punch from Zoe's father. Knox, you be asterisk starred. No matter how much Zoe has done to let you down, she shouldn't be suffering such revenge. You be asterisk starred. Zoe's father cursed. Zoe's mother was also crying her heart out, but Knox remained silent. Zoe's father was so angry that he went forward to hit Knox again. However, Knox's two subordinates quickly stopped him. Stop it, or I won't be polite. The two professional bodyguards naturally restrained Zoe's father. Knox looked at them coldly. I'll give you another one million dollars. Knox said coldly, you can take it as my buying Zoe's womb. You be asterisk starred, how can you say such words? Do you know that a woman without a uterus can never be with child anymore? Knox, you be asterisk starred, Knox's expression was indifferent as he listened to Zoe's father's insults. He said to his men, let's go. Aren't you waiting for Zoe to come out? No need. Her parents can take care of him. From now on, I have nothing to do with Zoe. With that, Knox left. Two of his men hurried after him. As soon as Zoe's parents saw Knox leaving, they were so angry that they started cursing again until Zoe's surgery was over, and she was pushed out. When she was pushed out, Zoe's complexion was terrifyingly pale. Zoe's parents hurriedly went up to ask, Zoe, how are you feeling? Do you feel any pain? Boohoo, tears streamed down Zoe's face. She really had not thought about losing her uterus because of that. So many people had undergone abortions, but why did she have to be the one to end up with such a small chance of having such an outcome? She never thought that she would end up like that by scheming against Knox. Be good. Don't cry. You need a lot of rest right now. Just like during postpartum, you need to take good care of yourself, Zoe's mother comforted her. You don't need to worry so much. We'll stay with you. Zoe gritted her teeth and nodded. Then, the doctors and nurses pushed Zoe into the ward, but there was no one there. Zoe asked, where's Knox? He left. Zoe's parents gnashed their teeth in anger. That beast, I really wish I can beat him to death. He left? Does he know I don't have a uterus anymore? Zoe asked. So what if he knows? Do you think he has a shred of conscience? Tears streamed down Zoe's face even more. Is Knox that cruel? I can't believe he can't even bear to see me. He promised to give us another one million dollars, but we don't know if he's lying. Zoe's father said, Zoe, forget about Knox. He has no conscience. Where's my phone? Zoe asked in anger. Zoe, where's my phone? I want to call Knox. I want to call him. What's the use in calling him? Give me my phone. Zoe yelled. Seeing that she had lost control of her emotions, Zoe's parents quickly found her phone. Zoe took the phone and frantically dialed Knox's number. She could not accept the way Knox treated her. She would accept even a little pity from him, but she could not accept that Knox was so heartless to her. She frantically dialed his number. However, Knox did not answer, and he eventually turned off his phone. Zoe was so angry that she wanted to smash her phone on the ground. Zoe, forget it. Knox won't be kind to you. Don't be angry because of him, Zoe's parents advised her. However, Zoe refused to listen. She gritted her teeth and dialed another number. Shelly was surprised to receive an unfamiliar call but still answered, Hello. I am Zoe. Where is Knox? Zoe asked straight away. Shelly pursed her lips, He's not back yet. You can call his cell phone. If I could reach him, would I need to call you? Zoe mocked. There's nothing I can do for you even if you push me. Knox is not here. As Shelly said that, she saw Knox open the door and walk into the living room. She said, He just got back. Give him the phone. Zoe screamed. Her voice was so loud that Shelly felt like that woman might have gone crazy. She hesitated for a moment but still handed her phone to Knox. Zoe is looking for you. Knox just stared at Shelly. I don't know what happened, but it sounds urgent, Shelly said as she handed over the phone. Then, she picked Bella, who was playing on the ground, up and went to Bella's room. 
It seemed like she was giving him space to talk to Zoe. Knox watched as Shelley left before holding to phone to his ear. What do you want? What do I want? Knox, I no longer have a uterus. What do you think I want? Didn't I promise to give you an extra one million dollars? Can money buy everything? I lost a uterus. Knox, you be asterisk starred. How are you so cold-blooded? I got pregnant for you and had an abortion for you, and now, I don't even have a uterus. Can you solve it with just one million dollars? Are you done cursing? Knox asked coldly. No, not yet. Someone like you should get hit by a car every time you go out. Why don't you just go die? Zoe was utterly devastated. She was cursing at the top of her lungs, so much so that her voice was hoarse. Meanwhile, Knox held the phone and listened to Zoe cursing with a cold expression. She cursed until she broke down and said, Knox, do you really have no sympathy for me? Shouldn't you treat me a little better because I've suffered so much for you? You didn't even thank me. How could you treat me like this? On the other end of the line, Zoe was wailing and crying miserably, probably because she could not accept that fact either. Knox gripped his phone tightly and said, I will give you one million as sympathy, but I don't feel anything for you. Knox. Zoe screamed, don't you have any conscience? Do you even know the baby was moving when it came out? Do you know that? Why aren't you dead yet? Why hasn't God punished you yet? Knox thought about it before saying, if I die, that's on me, and it has nothing to do with you. I will transfer the money to you immediately. As for what you'll say to my mother, you best think about it carefully. This is a deal, and a deal is a deal. Any harm you suffer from it has nothing to do with me. It was your own choice. Knox dash. Knox directly hung up on her. He wanted nothing to do with Zoe anymore and would never have sympathy for her. He was cold and heartless to anyone he had no connection to, just like how cruel he was to Shelley back then. It was all his own doing, and he deserved it. He knocked on Bella's door with the phone in hand. Shelley opened the door and looked at Knox, who returned her phone with the same expression. What happened to Zoe? Shelley asked. Zoe was so agitated just now that she thought something devastating had happened to Zoe. However, seeing Knox calm at that moment, Shelley thought it was just an illusion. Nothing I can't handle, Knox said, looking as if nothing had happened. Okay. Shelley nodded. Don't answer Zoe's call again. Okay. I'm going to work, Knox said. You're still going to work? Shelley asked as she thought he was not going to work after what happened. Don't you want me to? Knox asked back. Shelley chuckled and did not reply, so Knox chuckled too, just as a casual remark. I'm leaving, he said. M.M. Shelley nodded again. Knox chuckled again, but this time, it sounded a little ironic. That M.M. was really smooth. With that, Knox left the house. Shelley watched Knox leave and took a deep breath. It seemed like she had provoked him. When Mrs. Winter told Old Master Winter about Zoe's pregnancy, not only did she not get his support, but was also told that it was none of her business. He said it was Knox's decision to make and her not to interfere. Old Master Winter and Knox did not usually see eye to eye, so now that they were on the same side, Mrs. Winter was so angry that she could not sleep all night. After thinking about it, she decided to call Knox and confront him. She was determined to get the child in Zoe's belly no matter what. With that thought in mind, she called Knox, who was on his way to the company. When he saw his mother's call, he frowned before pressing the answer button and saying, Don't ask. Zoe's child has been aborted. What? Mrs. Winter was so angry that her lungs were about to explode. If you don't believe me, you can go to the hospital and ask her for yourself. Zoe is now in the VIP ward 888. After that, Knox hung up the phone abruptly and dialed Zoe's number. Upon receiving Knox's call, Zoe broke down again. What do you want? I'm just letting you know that my mother is coming soon. You know what to say, and if you mess things up, I'll take back everything I've given you. Knox threatened. Zoe's expression was grim. She realized that was Knox's true character, which was a hundred times more cold-blooded than she had expected. If she had known earlier, she should have controlled herself. She gritted her teeth and hung up the phone. Although she could not accept the fact that she had lost her uterus, she knew how cruel Knox could be and could only accept Knox's threat. Zoe waited in the ward for almost half an hour. Suddenly, the door was pushed open, and Mrs. Winter appeared in the ward with an anxious expression. She asked bluntly, where's the child? Zoe gritted her teeth and said, the child has been aborted. Are you crazy? How could you allow Knox to abort the child? Why didn't you call me? You knew to inform me yesterday but not today? Mrs. Winter could not but tear up. 
She had been waiting for a grandson for a long time, and now, that opportunity was gone. She was already in her fifties. In a few years, she would be too old to carry her grandchild. Moreover, with Knox's current attitude, she did not even know if she could have a grandson. How could she let it go like that? It's not Knox's child, so you don't have to feel sad about it. Zoe suddenly spoke up. Stunned, Mrs. Winter looked at Zoe in disbelief. She thought she had misheard. I told you, the child isn't Knox's, so you don't have to be upset. Zoe said bluntly. What did you say? Mrs. Winter looked at Zoe in disbelief. Just a while ago, Zoe was confident that the baby in her belly was Knox's, but why would she say it was not now? I lied to you. I deliberately lied to you for money. I knew you would believe me, Zoe said to Mrs. Winter. Now that it's over, I don't want to lie to you anymore. Mrs. Winter was about to faint from anger. She had never thought that Zoe would fool her like that, and it made her so angry that she rushed up to hit Zoe. Zoe's parents quickly stopped her. We didn't want to do this either, but Knox forced us into a corner. You don't have to feel bad. You can take Zoe losing her uterus from the abortion as her retribution, and we're even now. Even? Mrs. Winter was fuming with anger. Zoe, do you know my son and I got into an argument because of you? You deserve to lose your uterus. You deserve it. Yes, I deserve it. So, can you can leave now? Zoe yelled at Mrs. Winter. Ever since she had been exposed for cheating on Knox, her life had been miserable. Your family deserves to end up like this. Mrs. Winter cursed angrily. Then, she turned and left, not wanting to see Zoe for even a second longer. She was so angry that her lungs were about to explode. When she returned to the car, she thought for a moment and dialed Knox's number. Knox. Mom, I'm busy. I just went to see Zoe. She said the child wasn't yours. Just thinking about it makes me angry. Okay. As long as how you know awful Zoe is as a person, it's fine. Just ignore her in the future. I have to go. I'm about to start a meeting. When are you going to have a child with Shelley? By then, Knox had hung up the phone, and it made Mrs. Winter furious. She could not understand why Knox was so resistant to that topic. What was wrong with having a child? Fuming, Mrs. Winter gritted her teeth and dialed Shelley's number. When Shelley saw Mrs. Winter's call, she hesitated for two seconds before answering slowly, Hello. Shelley, you and Knox should have a baby soon, Mrs. Winter said. Shelley bit her lip. She did not expect Mrs. Winter to be so straightforward. She said, Auntie, let us handle our affairs ourselves. Just tell me, what will it take for you to have a child with Knox? Mrs. Winter did not want to beat around the bush. Yes, she was crazy about having a grandson. Knox and I are not yet at the point in our relationship where we want to have a baby yet. Shelley tried to explain calmly, we can have a child when the time is right. Knox is already 30 years old. Many 30-year-olds out there are still single at 30. Shelley, I've raised you for so many years. For my sake, marry Knox and have a baby as soon as possible. You have no idea how much I want a grandson very much. A few days ago, I was almost deceived by Zoe, Mrs. Winter said with great anger and sadness. Shelley frowned and asked in surprise, what happened to Zoe? Zoe came to me a few days ago and said she was pregnant with Knox's baby, so I believed her and didn't expect her to lie to me. The baby in her belly isn't Knox's at all. Shelley, please understand me. From now on, I will treat you as my daughter, Mrs. Winter said earnestly. How do you know that the baby in Zoe's belly is not Knox's? Shelley asked. She suddenly thought of Zoe looking for Knox yesterday and realized something was amiss. Zoe said it herself. She also aborted the child, so I guess she couldn't keep the secret anymore. Fortunately, God is all-knowing, and Zoe lost her uterus after aborting the child. It can be considered as revenge on her. Mrs. Winter was very angry. However, Shelley did not think it was that simple. Perhaps it was Knox who forced Zoe to say so. Otherwise, why would Zoe tell Mrs. Winter that the baby was not Knox's? There was no need for her to do that, so it meant that Knox killed his own child, and it must have been in a very cruel way. Shelley, please agree to have the baby with Knox as soon as possible, Mrs. Winter said sincerely. Auntie, I have to be frank with you. I cannot have a baby with Knox. I'm with him now because he helped me before and I'm repaying him. When he loses interest in me, we will break up, Shelley said frankly, deciding to come clean with Mrs. Winter. What? Mrs. Winter was surprised. You mean you're just fooling around with Knox? Yes, I am, Shelley confirmed. Shelley, you're not that kind of person. When did you become like this? Mrs. Winter was at a loss for words. 
You can also tell Knox to break up with me, Shelley said. I've never thought about spending the rest of my life with him. Why why you, Mrs. Winter was speakless for a long time. I'm sorry, Auntie, Shelley apologized because she knew she had hurt Mrs. Winter's feelings. I'm hanging up now. After that, Shelley ended the call. She really could not have any hope for Knox anymore. With how cold-heartedness he was to her before and to Zoe now, she found it hard to believe that Knox was a good person. Mrs. Winter was also very upset after the call. She knew there was no way Shelley could fall for Knox like that, but hearing Shelley's confession was still tough to stomach. Then, she gritted her teeth and called Knox again, but Knox had turned off his phone. Mrs. Winter was so angry that she threw her phone away, and her expression turned cold. Since Shelley had never thought about being with Knox, she would help her achieve it. At 6 p.m. in the afternoon, Knox came home from work, and Shelley was preparing dinner in the kitchen. Knox had planned to help but felt he could not do anything right, so he decided to play with Bella instead. Shelley put the dinner on the table and called Knox and Bella over to eat. Knox sat down at the table with Bella in his arms. Just as Bella was about to start eating, Shelley suddenly picked her up and took her to the sink to wash her hands. Knox watched them leave. In fact, Shelley could have told him to take Bella to wash her hands, but she would never let him help with anything. Sometimes, Knox wondered. Why was Shelley with him? To repay him because he helped her find Bella? Was it just to repay him? As Knox lowered his head and ate dinner, Shelley came back holding Bella, and they had dinner together. Shelley, Knox suddenly called her name. Hmm? Shelley looked at him. How do you feel about me now? Knox asked. Shelley was stunned, to say the least, as she did not expect Knox to ask that question out of the blue. She said, How do you want me to answer? Knox sneered in reply. Shelley continued, Your mother called me today. When Knox heard that, he frowned. She told me to have a child with you as soon as possible. She even told me about Zoe. You don't have to worry about her. Is Zoe's child yours? Shelley asked. Knox did not answer. Did you tell Zoe to tell your mother that the child wasn't yours? Shelley continued to speculate. Yes, Knox agreed. I used some money to make a deal with Zoe. I heard Zoe lost her uterus because of an abortion. What are you trying to say? Knox's expression was grim. Shelley pursed her lips. Nothing. Let's eat. Do you think I'm heartless and cruel? Knox asked her. Shelley, when can you speak honestly? Can you be more real with me? Can you say whatever you want to say? What do you want from me? Knox raised his voice. At that moment, he threw his chopsticks on the ground. All emotions erupted. Frightened by Knox's appearance, Bella quickly ran into Shelley's arms, her body trembling with fear. Shelley tightly hugged Bella in her arms. Bella, it's okay. Don't be afraid. Shelley comforted her. Bella cried out. Jenkel is scary. Be good. I will take you back to the room first, okay? Okay. Bella nodded quickly. Shelley had no choice but to carry Bella back to the room. Knox clenched his fists tightly as he watched them leave, and he was so angry that he kicked the chair next to him. The chair suddenly fell over, making a loud noise, which caused Bella's body to tremble with fear. Shelley quickly closed the door to the room. She knew that sooner or later, Knox would revert to his old self. In fact, it might not take long before his patience with her would run out as well. Shelley spent a long time in the room calming Bella down before letting her watch TV in the room while she left. However, when she left the room, Knox was no longer home. Seeing that the chair in the dining room was still overturned, she went over to lift the chair, reheated the cold food, and fed Bella. She also ate a little. By 9 p.m., she had put Bella to bed, and Knox was not back yet. Instead of thinking of calling Knox, Shelley washed up and then went back to the room to sleep. She roughly understood why Knox was so indifferent to her back then. Whatever he did not like, he would be indifferent to, and since she did not like Knox, she did not care about him. Yet, that night, she could not fall asleep. It could be because it had been a long time since Knox had not been so angry, and she felt troubled by it. After all, it was her fault, and she was still afraid after being traumatized the last time. At 1 a.m., Shelley could hear that Knox was back when he pushed the door open a little too hard. As soon as he came in, he made a clattering sound, probably bumping into things here and there. Shelley smelled a strong smell of alcohol from him and instantly knew that Knox was drunk. Drunk, he went straight to the bathroom, then came the gut-wrenching sound of vomiting. Shelley hesitated momentarily but still got up to pour a glass of water for Knox and placed it in front of him. Knox felt like he was throwing up everything in his system. Seeing the glass of water in front of him, 
Knox hesitated for a moment but took it and took a sip in the end. Are you feeling better? Shelley asked. Are you concerned about me? Knox asked. No, Shelley replied. I just don't want you to make too much noise. Why aren't you pretending anymore? Knox sat on the ground and turned to look at Shelley. His vision was blurred, but he could see Shelley's features clearly. I've never pretended. I've never said I care about you or even like you, Shelley said bluntly. I've thought about it a lot tonight, and I don't think it's a good idea for us to continue this relationship. Your mother really wants a grandson, but I can't help you with that, so why don't we break up now? Ha! Huh. Knox laughed in a self-deprecating manner. He chose to drink himself to death rather than come back to provoke her tonight, only to hear the word breakup in the end. Knox, I don't know what kind of feelings you have for me or whether you do like me. In any case, I've never liked you. In fact, I find you annoying, I feel inexplicably irritable around you, but I have to endure it. I even wish you did not speak to me or show me kindness. I'll be with you for half a year and use my body to repay you, but that is all. Therefore, to Shelley, she was selling her body and was hoping that Knox, her sugar daddy, would not ask her anything or affect her life. Just pure mating would do. When I went to the police station to close Bella's case, they told me that you almost died in the hands of a criminal gang to save her. Hence, I'm grateful to you, but that's all. I think we're dragging each other down by being together, which I'm fine with since I've never thought about marrying anyone or having a good future. However, you're different, you're the eldest son and heir of the winters and must carry on your family line. You're just wasting your time by being with me, so we should break up early. Shelley was talking to Knox seriously. Tonight, her insomnia tonight was caused by all the thinking she had done, and she realized that her relationship with Knox was dragging him down. In any case, she still owed the winters a favor and did not want to be ungrateful. Who said you're dragging me down? Knox sneered. Shelley stared at Knox. Do you really think I have to be with you, Shelley? Do you really think I can't have a child if you don't have one with me? You think too highly of yourself. I can have a son even without you. There are lots of women outside who are willing to have my child. Knox's voice grew louder. Shelley just watched as he threw a fit, knowing what he meant. Do you really think that when I'm together with you, you're the only one I'm seeing? Yes, I like you Shelley, but I don't know when I fell in love with you. You use my liking for you as an excuse to mistreat me, and I've endured it all. After all, it's no big deal if you don't treat me well. But Shelley, you can't break up with me even if you want to. I won't break up with you. Even if you're dragging me down, I won't break up with you. Knox said through gritted teeth. Why do you have to do this, Knox? Shelley also got angry. That's just who I am. I'm ruthless and evil, just like how I was to you back when you were in a car accident and I refused to visit you. That's just how cruel I am. Yes, I admit that the child in Zoe's belly was mine, and I aborted it. So what? I don't feel guilty, not even a bit, that Zoe lost her uterus because of the abortion. I will eliminate everyone who hurt me. I'm that terrible of a person, but so what? I'm Knox, and I can do whatever I want. What can you do to me? Knox said coldly. Nobody can do anything to me. The leader is my best friend. So, are you proud of who you are? Of being evil? Shelley gnashed her teeth and asked him. Yes. I'm proud of who I am. Knox said fiercely. So, don't mess with me, Shelley. If you make me mad, I'll make you wish you were dead. Knox. Shelley could not suppress her anger anymore. Not only can I do that to you, but I can do it to Bella too. If I can save her, I can also make her disappear the same way. You dash. Slap. Shelley slapped Knox hard across the face. She struck him so hard that her palm trembled from the pain. Enough, Knox. Why are you so such a horrible person? Shelley was clearly on the verge of breaking down. Knox endured Shelley's slap, his eyes a little red. Just as tears were about to flow from his eyes, he forcefully pushed Shelley away. Shelley was half squatting on the ground when Knox pushed her, and she fell to the ground. The next second, Knox stood up from the ground, turned his back to Shelley, and walked to the bathroom. Don't mess with me, Shelley. While I still like you, behave yourself. Then, when we break up, I can give you some benefits. Otherwise, don't blame me for not being kind to you. Shelley watched as Knox left coldly. To her, there was no one worse than Knox in this world, and she wondered why she met him. She used to think she was lucky to have entered the Winter family, but only now did she realize that it was just the beginning of a nightmare. When Shelley got up from the ground, Knox was washing his face with cold water. Shelley said, Knox, I've never regretted meeting you as much as I do now. I used to be so naive, 
thinking that it was a blessing to be your companion in the winters because the children in my hometown had to work hard, but the winters fed me, clothed me, and sent me to school. However, you ruined it all. Did you know that I had a miscarriage for you back then? Knox's body froze for a moment, and tears seeped out of the corner of his eyes. I never thought of telling you because, firstly, I didn't think you would care. And secondly, it was because I didn't want you to feel burdened. After all, we were no longer together. You see, even if you had pushed me away, I was considerate enough to respect you and cause as little distress to you as possible. However, you've never been considerate of anyone. Knox covered his face with both hands and kept splashing it with cold water. His body was trembling and shaking uncontrollably. In Shelley's opinion, he was just suppressing his anger. I'm telling you now because I don't think you're worth me doing anything for you. With that, Shelley turned around and left the bathroom. Anyway, she could not make Knox understand her, and no one could change Knox's decision. After Shelley left, Knox finally let go of his hands and looked in the mirror at the person with red eyes and tears in his eyes. Was he really that horrible of a person in Shelley's eyes? Did she not know that everything he said today was out of anger? He did not want to hurt her. His heart would even ache to see her lose a strand of hair. However, he could not let her go because he knew that Shelley would leave as soon as he let go. He was afraid that if she left, his world would crumble. Knox was in the bathroom for a long time while Shelley lay in bed, still awake. It was a quiet night. Eventually, Knox took a shower, and when he went to bed, Shelley's body tensed up. After Knox lay down, he moved closer to Shelley. Shelley sneered. It seemed like no matter how much they fought and how close they were to breaking up, Knox would always do what he wanted. In fact, why should she waste time on Knox? As Knox said, she should behave. Then, when they broke up, maybe she could still get some benefit from Knox. After the argument between Shelley and Knox, they both gave each other the silent treatment for a long time. Knox no longer came home right after work, and sometimes he did not come home for a whole night. Later on, she received a message from Knox's mother and saw an image of Knox having coffee with a beautiful woman, saying he was on a blind date. However, Shelley did not feel anything when she saw it. She told Knox's mother that she did not mind and even hoped that Knox could have a successful blind date. That way, she would not have to live under the same roof as Knox anymore. Tonight, she thought that Knox would not be back as usual, so she planned to take Bella out to eat the burgers and fried chicken that Bella wanted. They were celebrating Bella's first day of kindergarten tomorrow. Bella had been home for a long time, so Shelley thought she would try to enroll. Bella at a kindergarten nearby. The kindergarten immediately took Bella in and told Shelley to send Bella in any time she wanted. Hence, Shelley chose tomorrow. Shelley felt that regardless of what she taught Bella at home, Bella needed to be in a collective environment to grow up normally. Besides, Bella was an introvert and had been afraid of strangers since she was young, so Shelley hoped that Bella could be more lively and outgoing in the future. However, just as she opened the door with Bella holding her hand, she saw Knox outside, and their eyes met. Shelley was about to leave with Bella when Knox suddenly asked, Are you going out? Yeah, I'm taking Bella to have fried chicken, Shelley answered, She's going to kindergarten tomorrow. Oh, Knox replied, Have you eaten? Shelley asked, I don't think there's much food at home. Why don't you order takeout? Shelley spoke frankly. Knox smiled. Okay. Shelley did not allow him to tag along in the end. In fact, Shelley had been indifferent to him recently. It was obvious she was tired of living under the same roof as him, and it was probably because of his threat that night that Shelley did not dare to leave him. Just like that, Shelley left with Bella while Knox returned home. How long had it been since he came back for dinner? A month or two. He had finally mustered up the courage to come back, but he did not expect to be treated indifferently. Knox sat on the sofa, ready to order takeout on his phone when the phone suddenly rang. He looked at the caller ID and picked it up. Mom. How was today? Mrs. Winter asked excitedly. Not great, Knox answered calmly. Yes, his mother had been trying to set him up for blind dates for some time now. At first, he refused but later agreed, thinking that if he met the right person, he could get over Shelley. Although he felt a little unwilling to do it, he did not think he should make Shelley suffer with him, so he tried to force himself to like other women instead. However, the more he went on blind dates, the more disappointed he was. He did not like any of them. Every time he went out for coffee with someone, all he could think of was Shelley. He was always fantasizing that if one day, the person sitting across from him was Shelley and she was happy to see him, how wonderful that would be. Knox, what kind of girls do you like? 
Mrs. Winter was also a little desperate. In the past two months, Knox had been on nearly twenty blind dates, and all of them failed. The kind like Shelley. Knox. Mrs. Winter was a little angry. Forget it, Mom. Don't waste your energy on this anymore. I don't think I'll be able to get over Shelley for a while. Why are you so stubborn? Shelley really doesn't like you, and dragging it out is not a good idea. For both of your sakes, you should break up with her, Mrs. Winter advised. I know how to handle it, Knox said, a little annoyed. Don't worry about it. If I don't worry about it, are you planning to spend the rest of your life with Shelley? Mrs. Winter exclaimed. Knox sighed. Give me another year. Huh? If my relationship with Shelley is still the same after a year, I'll break up with her. Then, under your arrangements, I'll go on blind dates with other women and get married and have children. Are you sure? Mrs. Winter did not seem to believe him. Yes. When have I failed to keep my promises? Okay, I'll believe you this once. A year was still acceptable to Mrs. Winter. In that case, promise me you won't disturb Shelley and me during this time. Knox negotiated his conditions. Okay, Mrs. Winter agreed immediately. As long as you keep your word, I'll keep mine. I'll hang up now. Yeah. Knox put down his phone and leaned back on the sofa, not having much of an appetite. Who could have an appetite when eating alone anyway? He might as well lie on the sofa like a corpse. Shelley ordered Bella's favorite hamburger and fried chicken and was looking for a place to eat them with Bella when the phone suddenly rang. The moment Shelley saw the caller ID, her expression darkened. She really did not want to answer Mrs. Winter's call right now. However, she eventually picked up the phone and said, Auntie. Shelley, are you with Knox? That's good. The other side let out a sigh of relief. I just wanted to ask if you do want to leave Knox. Auntie, please just say what you want to say, Shelley said frankly. Knox promised he'd be with you for a year, after one year, he'd leave you. If you don't want to be with him, try to be as cold to him as possible, and don't satisfy his needs. Just persevere for a year, and both of you will be free. Okay. Shelley nodded. Shelley, I'll be really happy if you and Knox could be together, but unfortunately, you have no feelings for him. So, it's useless for me to force you to be with him. Now that Knox is willing to let go, it's up to you. I know what to do, Shelley replied. In that case, I won't say much more. Thank you. No need, Shelley said indifferently. After all, it was a foregone conclusion, and there was no need for Mrs. Winter to thank her. I won't disturb you anymore. Bye. Bye. When Shelley hung up the phone, Bella looked at her expression and asked innocently, Mom, who was that? An ordinary person. Eat up. Shelley came back to her senses and picked up the hamburger for Bella. Mom, what's going on between you and Uncle Knox? You two don't seem to talk anymore, Bella asked worriedly. It's nothing. Shelley patted Bella's head. In a year, we can leave him and live on our own. Is that true? Bella asked, not looking particularly happy. Shelley was a bit surprised. After all, Bella not disliked Knox, did she not? The next second, she heard Bella ask again, will Uncle Knox be lonely on his own? He won't be lonely, Shelley said bluntly. Knox had so many friends and women around him. Even though he might be upset after the breakup, he certainly would not be lonely. Is that so? Bella looked at Shelley the last time Uncle Knox lost his temper with you and made me cry, he apologized to me later. Shelley was stunned. Uncle Knox told me not to tell you. He apologized to you? Yeah. He said he was just a little upset about work that day, so he got angry. It was not at me or you, Mom, and he asked if I could forgive him, Bella said earnestly. So, I forgave him. Oh? You forgave him so easily, huh? It was because Uncle Knox was sincere. He even bought me the ice cream that you wouldn't let me eat. Bella blushed as she spoke. Shelley furrowed her brows. I'm sorry, Mom. I shouldn't have lied to you, Bella quickly apologized. Then, Shelley patted Bella's head. It's okay, but you have to tell me the next time. We agreed not to keep secrets between us, remember? Okay. Bella nodded. Let's eat. Shelley handed Bella the hamburger. Bella took a bite and said, Mom, I think Uncle will definitely be lonely without us. He won't be, Shelley said. He will. I often see him staring off into space, watching you, Bella said. He's been doing that after the fight. Shelley looked at Bella. She did not expect a three-year-old to be so observant. That was why adults should not think that children knew nothing because they could see it all. That's because, Shelley did not know how to explain it to Bella, so she used the reason that adults often like to use. You'll know in the future. Oh. Bella was a little unhappy. Be good, 
and we'll head back after eating. You still have school tomorrow, so you have to sleep early. All right. Bella could only nod obediently. After having hamburgers and fried chicken, Shelly and Bella were ready to leave. Suddenly, Bella called out to Shelly, Mommy. What's wrong? Can we buy more? Bella asked. Aren't you full? It's unhealthy to eat so many hamburgers and fried chicken, you're still a growing child. I will bring you here again next time, okay? Shelly comforted Bella. No, I want to bring some back for Uncle Knox. Shelly paused. Didn't you ask him if he had dinner just now? Bella asked. Bella was so thoughtful that even Shelly felt a little guilty. As she had always lived under someone else's roof and did not have a father, Bella had always been good at reading people's expressions since she was young. She patted Bella's head. Uncle might have eaten already. What if he hasn't? Bella asked, still determined on getting Knox dinner. Shelly was helpless. All right, we'll buy some back, but I can't guarantee that he will eat it. Because even if Uncle hasn't eaten dinner, he might not eat this kind of food. That won't happen. As long as you bought it, Uncle Knox would eat it, Bella said firmly. Shelly patted Bella's head and did not take Bella's words to heart. She went to take away a hamburger and fried chicken before going home with Bella. When she opened the door, Knox was lying on the sofa, seemingly asleep. From the looks of it, he probably had not eaten dinner yet. In fact, Knox had never taken care of himself. Uncle Knox. The moment Bella entered the living room, she called out to Knox loudly. Shelly could not stop Bella even if she wanted to. She knew very well how angry Knox was when he woke up. If Bella woke Knox up, Knox might lose his temper again. However, at that moment, Knox opened his tired eyes in a daze. When he saw Bella, not only was he not angry, but he even smiled. You're back so soon. Yes, we also packed hamburgers and fried chicken for you, Bella said excitedly. It's with mommy. Bella turned to look at Shelly. Shelly had no choice but to walk to Knox with the takeout in her hand. Bella told me to pack just now. Do you want to eat it? If you don't, I'll make you dinner. Knox simply stared at Shelly, not expecting Shelly to have packed food for him. I'll go make dinner for you, Shelly said when she saw that Knox did not take it. No need. I'll eat. Knox took it and explained, I thought you would rather starve me to death than pack food for me. Shelly was speechless. Was she that vicious? Mommy won't starve you to death. Bella hurriedly said, on the way back, Mommy said that if you don't want the food we packed for you, she'll make you dinner. Mommy won't starve you to death. Knox could not help but laugh. He was truly amused by Bella. Shelly looked at Knox's smile and froze for a moment before saying, if you're fine with it, eat up. If not, I'll cook for you after I help Bella with washing up. As she spoke, she carried Bella into the room, and Knox watched as they went into the room. He thought, perhaps if he could not woo Shelly in one year, he would let her go and allow Shelly to go back to living her life. After Shelly bathed Bella and coaxed her to sleep, she walked out of the room to see that Knox had finished the burger and fried chicken, leaving behind an empty takeaway bag. When she walked over, Knox even burped. He was really full, and even he did not know how he had finished all that. Shelly, too, did not expect Knox to finish it in one go. After all, the hamburger and fried chicken were enough to feed two people. At that moment, she saw that Knox was slumped on the chair from eating a little too much. Hence, she tidied up the takeout box and poured Knox a glass of water. Drink some water. Knox glanced at Shelly. Thank you. Shelly nodded and stood up to leave. Her attitude toward him was still lukewarm. Shelly walked into the kitchen to boil some water. Although there was an electric kettle at home, she was used to boiling a pot of water. It was just a habit. Somehow, she believed that boiling water was better. While she waited for the water to boil, Knox finished his cup of water and brought to cup to the kitchen. Shelly naturally took it and was prepared to wash it when Knox stopped her. I'll wash it myself. Shelly nodded. All right. Just as Knox was about to wash it, he thought of what Shelly said about him not doing anything right and felt like he was causing trouble for Shelly. Hence, he thought about it and said, you should wash it. Shelly looked at Knox, who she found a little weird sometimes. Nevertheless, she took Knox's cup and rinsed it. Then, she wiped it down with a towel before placing it back in the cupboard. Knox observed her silently. If he had washed it himself, he would probably have just washed it and left it at the side. As such, he noted down what Shelly did in his mind. It's getting late. You should go wash up. I'll go back to the room after the water boils. All right. Knox nodded. He knew that Shelly did not like him being by her side, so he decided to compromise and live peacefully with her for the next year. 
At the very least, he did not want Shelley to find him more annoying. The moment he turned to leave, the kettle whistled. Shelley was about to put the water bottle into the thermos flask when the handle of the kettle suddenly came off. Shelley watched, in shock, as the boiling water was about to pour on her. Suddenly, two large hands caught the kettle. The moment they caught it, the water from the kettle spilled out and drenched the back of Knox's hands. Knox gritted his teeth and endured it. Then, he placed the kettle on the bar counter and turned around to ask anxiously, Did you get scalded? Shelley was stunned. Where did you get burned? Knox asked anxiously. Shelley was not scalded. However, she looked at the back of Knox's hand, which was red and blistering, looking very ferocious. Yet, he kept asking her where she was hurt as if he could not feel the pain. Knox, the back of your hand. Shelley pointed at his hand. Knox instinctively shrank back as he did not want Shelley to see it. It's a serious burn, Shelley said. It's nothing, Knox said indifferently. Knox. It's really nothing, Knox said bluntly, did you get burned? I didn't, but your hand dash. I said it's fine. Knox started to get angry. Shelley bit her lip, knowing how short-tempered Knox was. However, after Knox lost his temper, he immediately regretted it. He simply wanted to get along with Shelley and did not wish for them to fight and not talk to each other for two months. At that thought, he suddenly stretched his hands out, showing the back of them which were badly burned. Yes, you're right. I can't do anything right. All I know is to cause trouble for you, Knox said in exasperation. Shelley felt a little guilty, and it made her wonder whether she had been too harsh on him. She gritted her teeth and held Knox's hand to the tap to rinse it. Let's rinse it for now and head to the hospital later. You can't be careless with burns. Shelley quickly left the kitchen and took Knox's phone. What's your password? I'll call your assistant and get him to pick you up. Bella is alone at home, so I can't send you to the hospital. Knox said nothing. Knox. Shelley was worried. Please. Knox hesitated before telling her the password, and his face turned a little red after he said it out loud. It was because his password was Shelley's birthday. He used to despise those who did it and thought it was stupid. However, after he got together with Shelley, he could not help but change all his passwords to numbers related to Shelley. Only then did he know that when one liked someone, they would do a lot of stupid things. It was so childish that he questioned whether he was himself. Shelley was a little embarrassed when she entered Knox's password. However, it was over soon. She asked, what's your assistant's name? Knox told her his name, and Shelley dialed a number. The call was quickly connected. The other party was extremely respectful. Mr. Winter. I'm Shelley, Knox says. Shelley paused. Girlfriend. Hearing the word girlfriend warmed Knox's heart. It was as if he had heard the most pleasant voice in the world. Damn it. Calm down, he secretly told himself and stopped smiling. Knox was scalded by boiling water, and it's very serious. Can you take him to the hospital? It's not convenient for me now. All right, Mrs. Winter, the other party quickly said. Shelley held her breath. Did not she say that she was his girlfriend? Mrs. Winter, where's Mr. Winter now? I'll be right there. Shelley gave him the addresses. The other party said bluntly, Mrs. Winter, you could have told me he was at home. I often send Mr. Winter home, and no matter how late it is, Mr. Winter will always go back. Sometimes, even if he doesn't go upstairs, he'll fall asleep in the parking lot downstairs. Shelley was speechless at how talkative the assistant was. Besides, she did not want to know so much. Mrs. Winter, I'll be there in ten minutes, the other party said respectfully. All right, sorry to trouble you. Shelley hung up the phone and said to Knox, he said he'll be here in ten minutes. All right. Knox nodded. Where should I put your phone? After all, Knox's hands were injured. My pocket. Shelley put the phone into his pocket. As her fingers touched his thigh, Knox could feel his heart racing. After Knox's assistant picked him up, Shelley cleaned up at home and boiled some water again. For some reason, her mind was filled with the image of Knox reaching out to help her with the water just now. Then, she pursed her lips and stopped herself from overthinking it. At the thought of the one-year deadline that Mrs. Winter had mentioned, she looked forward to it even more. However, she also wondered if it was because of the one-year deadline that she did not resist Knox so much. After all, it was only one year. When Knox returned, Shelley was already asleep, so Knox carefully returned to the room and went to bed. The burn on Knox's hand was pretty serious, so the doctor wrapped it up like a ball. Although it was no longer swelling and blistering, he could not touch Shelley. 
Just like that, he stared at the ceiling melancholically, wondering whether he could expect anything in the one-year deadline he gave himself. The days seemed to have returned to normal since Shelley and Knox were no longer giving each other the silent treatment. Their lives were still the same, with nothing much happening. All in all, there was no progress in their relationship. One day, Knox had just returned home from work that day when he suddenly received a call from Jean and was flattered by it. For some reason, he felt that Jean was superior to him because, in his mind, a woman who could capture Edward's heart was no simple person. Knox, where are you? Jean asked anxiously. I'm at home. I just got off work. What's wrong? Are you buying me a drink tonight? Knox asked casually. Damn it. Monica is in labor. What? Knox was also shocked. It's only been a few months, and she's already in labor? It's been nine months, Jean said. And since it's twins, they usually come a little earlier. I'm going to the hospital now, so you should hurry over too. I'm afraid Monica will be nervous. Oh, okay, I'll be right there. Knox quickly hung up the phone. However, he was still mumbling to himself, how is Monica in labor so soon? She was walking fine the last time I saw her. Knox was excited as well. Knox, did you say that Monica is in labor? Shelley asked. That was what Jean told me on the phone just now. I didn't ask for the details, but I'm going to the hospital now. Knox quickly said, I won't be home for dinner tonight. Can I go with you? Shelley suddenly asked. Do you want to? Knox was surprised. Shelley nodded. She just really wanted to see Monica. Sure. What about Bella? Knox asked. Can I bring Bella along? All right. Knox agreed immediately. His reply put a bright smile on Shelley's face. Knox was a little lost in thought as he stared at her smile. The moment he came back to his senses, he could not help but curse, F asterisk CK. Even Monica can make Shelley so happy. With that, Shelley quickly carried Bella and left in Knox's car. Shelley and Bella sat in the back seat while Knox drove a little faster than usual. As he drove, he said to Shelley, I didn't expect Monica to go into labor so soon. She was the one who didn't want the children at first, and Finn was panicking. Fortunately, Monica's heart softened in the end. Based on my understanding of Monica, she probably couldn't bear to abort the babies. Who knows? Monica can be heartless sometimes too. Knox commented, if she were cruel enough to abort the children back then, Finn would have been devastated. You have no idea how badly he wants children. Shelley nodded and suddenly thought of Mrs. Winter, who wanted grandchildren so badly that she went crazy. Having noticed Shelley's sudden silence, Knox did not say anything else either. Soon, they arrived at the hospital and entered the delivery room. When Knox showed up with Shelley, there were already quite a few people in the delivery room corridor, including Monica's parents, Sarah, Edward, Jean, and Monica's subordinate, Brandon. As they walked over, they added to the crowd, and Monica's shouts could be vaguely heard in the corridor. Knox quickly asked, How is it? Has she given birth? Do you think we'll be standing here if she has? Jean asked, a little speechless. Knox rolled his eyes. Is this Shelley? Jean asked Knox. In fact, they had met before. However, they had never been introduced formally, so they needed that method to make things less awkward for each other. Yes, this is Shelley, Knox quickly said. And this is my daughter, Bella. Shelley almost choked when Knox introduced Bella as his daughter. Jean chuckled and said to Shelley, Hello, I'm Candace. I know. You're the leader's wife. Shelley said, a little too respectfully. At that moment, she even glanced at Edward beside her. It was as if he wanted to greet him but did not dare to. To the rest, who often saw Edward, they were already very casual with him. However, to an ordinary person like Shelley, who had not interacted much with Edward, Edward's presence was still intimidating. You don't have to care too much about his identity. Jean said bluntly, at the end of the day, he and Knox are best friends, so you can just treat him as your best friend too. All right. Shelley quickly nodded. She found the woman before her easygoing. Not only did she not put on any airs, but she was also very sincere and polite. You've been with Knox for so long, but this is the first time we've seen you. Every time I tell Knox to bring you over for a meal or go out for a meal, he would say that you had to stay home to take care of Bella. Next time, you should bring Bella along. I have children too, two of them and I occasionally bring them out with me. Jean started the conversation. Oh, okay. Shelley nodded. In fact, Knox had never invited her out before. Occasionally, when Knox was not home for dinner, he would call her and tell her who he was having dinner with. 
Many times, he would be calling her with the person in front of him, but he had never invited her, probably because he thought she would not attend. In the delivery room, Monica's heart-wrenching scream suddenly rang out, and it disrupted the originally peaceful atmosphere outside. Gary was getting a little impatient. Does she need a C-section? Didn't they say that most who have twins chose to have a C-section? Otherwise, the risk factor will be high. Ruby was also nervous. Should we ask Finn about it? I know it's good for Monica to have a natural birth, but if she can't do it. Before Ruby could finish her sentence, her entire face turned pale. Auntie, relax. Jean quickly went up to comfort Ruby. When Monica was sent to the hospital, she had dilated five centimeters. Moreover, both fetuses are healthy, so natural birth will be easy for her. On the other hand, a C-section will affect both Monica and the baby. So, don't worry. Finn knows what he has to do. Nothing will go wrong. But every time I hear Monica scream, I get nervous. Everybody screams when they're in labor. I'd be nervous if Monica didn't. Having been convinced by Jean, Ruby nodded and muttered to herself again, as if she was comforting himself. In the corridor, Monica's shouts could be heard from time to time, and in the delivery room, Monica was in so much pain. She had Finn by her side while someone else delivered the baby, so Finn was sitting beside her and helping her with the delivery. Finn, shut up. Monica shouted. The doctors in the delivery room were shocked by Monica's sudden outburst. You're a man. What right do you have to teach me how to give birth? You've never given birth before. Do you know how it feels? Ah, Monica screamed. She was in so much pain that her entire body was about to cramp up. She once thought that the childbirth scenes on television were all exaggerated, but only after experiencing it herself did she know that it was worse than death. She almost fainted from the pain. Even if I've never seen a pig run or walk before, I'll naturally know how to make one do it after seeing it many times. Who are you calling a pig? Huh? Monica shouted. I'm just making an analogy. You're calling me a pig. If I'm not a pig, how could I give birth to two babies at once? Finn was speechless. Finn, I want a C-section. Aya! Monica screamed. It was so painful that she began to suspect that everything in her life was a lie. She did not want to give birth anymore. She would rather lie in bed and be dissected than give birth to her children. Mrs. Jones, your cervix has dilated six centimeters. If you persist, you'll be able to push the babies out. Moreover, your fetal position is great. As long as you push a little harder, you'll be done before you know it. The midwife was also encouraging her. I refuse to push. Monica refused. She was in so much pain, whereas those people were all standing there, so it was easy for them to say. Finn, arrange a C-section for me immediately. I want a C-section immediately. Don't stop me. Monica resisted. Instead of using all her strength to push, it was all spent on quarreling. The midwife shook her head at Finn. It meant that with the effort Monica was putting in, she would not be able to give birth to the children in time. Finn turned to look at Monica, whose face was red as she said, Ah, Finn, hurry up and give me a C-section. I can't hold on any longer dash. Even if you can't, you have to persevere. Finn's voice suddenly became stern. Monica was stunned. She looked straight at Finn and wondered how someone so gentle just a moment ago could suddenly turn heartless. Every woman has to go into labor, not just you. When Jean was in labor, it took her all day and a night to give birth to Paige, but look at you. You're less than two hours in, and you're screaming the place down. Can't you be a little braver? Finn, how dare you yell at me? Monica looked at him with a face full of grievance, and tears were about to stream down her face. What right did Finn have to scold her when she had worked so hard and painfully to give birth to his children? Hurry up and give birth to the babies. I won't let you have a C-section. Finn. Monica was fuming. How can you do this? Why why you? If you hadn't gotten me pregnant back then, would I be suffering now? How could you stand at the side and make such nasty remarks? Finn was indeed a little embarrassed. Meanwhile, the doctors and nurses at the side listened and tried to hold back their laughter. Then, they put on a serious face and pretended they did not hear it. How could you mock me at a time like that? Finn, do you have a conscience? Besides, Jean only had to give birth to one at a time, while I have to give birth to two at once. What gives you the right to do this to me? My stomach is as big as a ball now, and I don't know if I'll have to live with this ball after giving birth. You've ruined my figure. Ah. Monica cursed in pain. If she could get up now, she would fight Finn to the death. Mrs. Jones, if you put all your effort into pushing, you'll be able to do it. Look, you were dilated six centimeters just now, 
but now it's seven. Soon, you'll be able to meet your babies. I don't want to meet my babies. Monica screamed. I don't want to give birth to this SC asterisk bag's children. Everyone was speechless when they heard Monica call Dr. Jones, their hospital's prince charming who had resigned and was irreplaceable, a SC asterisk bag. I don't want to do this anymore. Even if it means I have to die, I won't do it. I want to go back. Monica cried out in despair. Do you think it will stop hurting if we go back? Finn asked, if we do go back, I'll be the only one delivering the baby, and didn't you refuse to let me deliver the babies? If you don't take this seriously, I'll deliver the babies. No. Monica shouted. I'd rather kill myself than have you deliver my babies. Actually, Dr. Jones can deliver your babies. The midwife said, there's a superstition in the obstetrics department that the father of the child can quicken the delivery of the child because of a tacit understanding between the child and the father. Since you're in so much pain, why don't you give it a try? No. Monica shouted frantically. Why? Give it a try, Mrs. Jones? No. I heard that if a husband helps with his wife's delivery, the husband will become impotent. I can't let these two smelly brats ruin my s asterisk x life. Monica said righteously. The doctors and nurses could not help but laugh. If Monica could consider all that at a time like this, it did not seem like she was in too much pain. Don't you hate me? Why are you still thinking about s asterisk x? Finn's voice was much gentler as he approached Monica. Hoof. Monica ignored Finn. Even if he tried to please her, she would never forgive him. Be good and put more effort into pushing. I'll make sure to take good care of you in the future. There was a hint of seduction in Finn's deep voice. All the doctors and nurses in the room shuddered when they heard him. It made them wonder who commented that Dr. Jones was aloof when he was so affectionate to Mrs. Jones. Finn moved closer to Monica's ear and whispered so softly that only the two of them could hear him. I meant in bed. Monica was originally in so much pain, but when she heard Finn's explicit words, her face instantly turned red. She could not believe he was thinking about sleeping with her when she was in labor. This SC asterisk bag. B asterisk starred. Mrs. Jones, try to push down. Don't scream too much. Just breathe and channel your breath downward. Let's give it a try, okay? The midwife coaxed, I think you'll be able to give birth to the baby soon. Ugh, Monica gritted her teeth and went with it because she knew that Finn would not perform a C-section on her. Moreover, she had thought it through clearly. A wise man would not fight when the odds were against him, so she would take it up to Finn after everything was done. If she were to argue with him now, she would be the one suffering instead. With that thought in mind, she took a deep breath and followed the midwife's instructions, trying to push down. M.M., after Monica used up all her strength, she felt a sharp pain, and it hurt like hell. Yes, that's right. Keep going, Mrs. Jones. The midwife kept encouraging her. Monica pushed hard several times. Ah, it hurts. Monica's eyes were filled with tears. She was in so much pain that she felt like she was about to die. She really could not do it anymore. Finn also seemed to have noticed Monica's discomfort, and unlike before, she was in so much pain that her face was pale. He knew that if she were a little braver, she would be able to give birth naturally. However, seeing her in pain at that moment. Monica had always been afraid of pain, even just a little, and childbirth was excruciatingly painful. Although he could not feel the pain, he also seemed to be in pain. More specifically, his heart ached. He said to the midwife, we'll switch to a C-section. Monica thought she had misheard as she did not expect Finn to give in so suddenly. Just moments ago, he was determined for her not to have a C-section. Finn confirmed again, contact the best anesthetist in our hospital and switch to a C-section. Hurry up. I'm afraid that the babies in her stomach will suffocate. But she's doing so well. She's about to be 7 centimeters dilated. Let's do a C-section. Finn was determined. The midwife was helpless, but she, too, knew that Dr. Jones did not want Mrs. Jones to suffer anymore. Hence, she turned to Monica and said, Mrs. Jones, I should inform you that you already have a horizontal cut on your lower body. If you go for a C-section now, it means you'll have another cut on your stomach. That'll make it two cuts. What? Monica shouted, if I have two cuts, does it mean it'll leave two scars? The C-section will definitely leave a scar, but I'll sew up your lower body for you after the C-section, so it should be fine, no, I'll be ugly. Monica could not accept it. All C-sections work that way, the midwife said. I'll give birth naturally. Monica suddenly became determined. She would rather die than have a scar on her stomach. 
During her pregnancy, she paid great attention to taking care of her belly. Although carrying twins made her belly huge, she barely had any stretch marks in the end. That was why she refused to have a C-section, which would leave a scar on her belly. But Dr. Jones said to have a C-section. I'm the pregnant one here, so he doesn't get to make the decision. If not for him, would I be in so much pain? Don't you listen to him. Monica cried out in despair. Then, Mrs. Jones, pushed down harder. I'll try my best to help you give birth naturally. Monica nodded. Then, she followed the midwife's and the nurse's instructions. She took a deep breath and pushed down. Ah! Monica could not help but scream in pain. Finn held Monica's hand the entire time. Even though Monica could not stand the pain anymore, she refused to do a C-section and go under the knife. Hence, she gritted her teeth and continued to push. Seeing how brave and in pain Monica was, Finn placed his hand beside Monica's mouth. Monica, who was in so much pain that she had lost all rationality, bit the back of Finn's hand, and Finn did not even make a sound. After all, he could not feel any pain at all. Monica bit so hard that blood oozed out. However, she did not notice it as she was focused on pushing the baby out. Mrs. Jones, I can see the baby's head now. Push! The baby will be out soon, the midwife said excitedly. Monica did not dare to rest. She was afraid that once she stopped, she would not be able to muster up the courage to push any more. Hence, she pushed again, with every ounce of strength left in her, and grabbed Finn's arm tightly. It felt like she had used up her entire life's worth of energy. The midwife said excitedly, it's out. It's a boy. In the next second, Monica heard a baby cry in the delivery room and finally breathed a sigh of relief. However, the midwife reminded her, Mrs. Jones, there's one more. Let's continue. At that moment, Monica really wanted to kill herself. She was on the verge of breaking down. Finn, you be asterisk starred. I'm going to kill you. Not only did he make her pregnant, but he even put two babies in her. Monica screamed hysterically. She really wished she could kill Finn and then smash her head into Finn's embrace. She had finally given birth to one, but why was there another one in her belly? The people waiting outside were also extremely anxious. Ruby, for one, could not remain calm. She kept walking in the corridor and mumbling, why isn't she out yet? Why is she screaming like that? Why isn't she? Just then, the door to the delivery room suddenly opened. A nurse came out with a baby in her arms. Monica's family. Everyone in the corridor rushed toward the nurse excitedly, and it shocked the nurse. It looked as if they were all here to snatch the child away from her. She said, it's a boy. Dr. Jones said to bring the first child out for you to take a look. As for the second child, the mother is still in labor. All right, all right. Ruby quickly went forward to hold the child. At least one is out. He is exactly five pounds. The nurse said, the twins are relatively good-looking, and they don't need to be placed in the incubator for the time being. You guys can hold him. When the other baby is born, I'll take them to get their vaccinations. All right, all right, Ruby said again. She was really excited. By the way, how is Monica? Ruby quickly asked. Then, a loud voice came from the delivery room. Finn, USC asterisk bag. I'd like to see you try getting me pregnant next time. Ah. The atmosphere in the corridor turned awkward. Before the door opened, everyone could only vaguely hear Monica's shouts coming from inside. However, now that the door was opened, they could hear her clearly, and Ruby felt embarrassed for her daughter. The nurse smiled. The patient is in good spirits. Don't worry. Besides, Dr. Jones is accompanying her in the delivery room, so she'll be fine. I'll head back in now. Thank you, miss. Sorry to trouble you. The nurse nodded slightly, turned around, and walked in. Knowing that Monica was in good spirits, everyone outside was less worried about her, and they all turned their attention to the newborn baby. At that moment, the baby was not crying or making a fuss. His eyes were open as he looked at the people who came to visit him. They were filled with curiosity about the world. He's so cute, Jean could not help but say. How is he cute? Knox looked at him in disdain. He's so wrinkled like an old man. Ow. Knox covered his head, not knowing why Edward hit him. However, Ruby did not mind Knox's comment. She said, all babies are like this. They're considered good-looking. In any case, she found her grandson very good-looking. Come, let me hold him. Gary was also beyond excited. That won't do. You're clumsy. What if you don't hold him properly? You're the clumsy one. When you gave birth to Monica, wasn't I the one who held her and fed her? 
and you're saying I can't hold him properly? Gary said angrily. Ruby blushed. Old man, what nonsense are you spouting? Let me hold him. Let me hold my grandson. Wait a moment. Ruby refused to let go. Can't you see that Monica is still in labor? Can't you hold the younger one? Won't the baby feel uncomfortable if we pass him around? In the end, Gary let Ruby have it her way. Hence, he could only look at his grandson with a doting expression. Jean, on the other hand, was watching them the entire time. Although they were bickering, it seemed nice to have parents. Then, someone suddenly hugged her from the back. Jean turned around to see that it was Edward, who seemed to know what she was thinking just by looking at her expression. After all, the two of them were now orphans. As Jean leaned into Edward's embrace, Edward's lips curled into a smile, and he whispered in her ear, You can call me daddy too. Jean glared at him, speechless at how he was taking advantage of her, and Edward smiled brightly. When Knox saw the interaction between the two of them, he turned around in disgust and decided not to look as it was a sight for sore eyes. Just as he turned around, he saw Shelley sitting on a chair in the corridor with Bella on her lap. She was sitting with Sarah, and they were talking in low voices. However, Shelley had a bright smile on her face, one that was completely different from when she was with him. He quickly looked away and thought might as well take a look at Finn's eldest son. Hence, he walked to Ruby and glanced over at the baby from time to time. That was when he concluded he was right. Finn's eldest son was ugly. In the delivery room, Monica felt like she was going to die. She had no strength left to push and wanted to take a breather, but Finn and the midwife refused to let her rest. They said the baby might lack oxygen if it stayed inside for too long. However, she was exhausted. If she continued, she would die from exhaustion. Mrs. Jones, if you push as much as you just now, your second baby will be out soon, the midwife said quickly. I'm out of breath, and I don't have any strength left. I've used up everything I have to give birth to the baby boy. Monica panted heavily. If you don't have any strength left, we'll have to use a vacuum to take the baby out, the midwife said. What? Otherwise, if the baby is in there for too long, it might run out of oxygen. Then, what will become of me? Monica asked emotionally. Were they going to put a vacuum in her? Was giving birth to a baby so scary? Just thinking about it terrified her. A fertile land, Finn added. As soon as he said that, the originally serious atmosphere in the delivery room lightened up when everyone left. Monica was about to die from anger. Finn, how are you still in the mood to joke around with me? I'm about to die. You won't die. Finn said seriously, I won't allow you to die. But I really can't push anymore. You can. I really. Then, get a vacuum. Boohoo, Monica felt aggrieved. She could not understand why it was so difficult to give birth to a child. She shouted at Finn, why can't a man give birth to a child? Why must a woman give birth to a child? Why can't you do it? If do it, I can make sarcastic remarks at the side too. Finn caressed Monica's cheek. If it's possible, I would. All you know how to do is coax me. Although she did not believe Finn, she calmed down a lot after hearing Finn's comforting words. Be good. If you push harder, we will be able to meet our second baby soon. Why do I have to get pregnant with two at once? Boohoo, Monica cried and pushed at the same time. She, too, knew that if she delayed it any longer, she would not be able to accept it if anything happened to the baby. Hence, she gritted her teeth and pushed harder, with the midwife and Finn helping her. Monica took a deep breath again and pushed. At that moment, she could not even make a sound because the moment she cried out, she would lose the rhythm of her breath and it would be harder for her to push. Fortunately, after the first one was born, the second one was much smoother. About ten minutes later, the midwife quickly said, All right, don't push too much. Breathe slowly. I can see the baby. Monica did as the midwife said. Finally, she felt like she had pooped out a thousand years worth of shit, and she instantly felt relaxed. It was as if a huge weight had been taken off her body. In the delivery room, another baby's cry sounded and it was much louder than the previous babies. Then, she heard the midwife doctor say, girls are naturally more prone to crying than boys. Monica was stunned when she heard it was a girl, and so was Finn. All his attention was originally on Monica as he was touched that she had given birth to two babies for him. However, when he heard the midwife's words, he was a little distracted. They had done so many prenatal checkups but had never been able to see the gender of the baby. Hence, Finn eventually stopped trying to figure it out and thought they might as well find out when the baby was born. It was what it was, and he had mentally prepared himself to have two sons. 
however, he did not expect the baby that he had never been allowed to see the gender of to be a shy girl. At that moment, the smile on his face changed, and he became gentler. Finn, you're smiling. Monica looked at the change in Finn's expression and was unhappy about it. She knew that Finn would not love her as much anymore after he had a daughter. You gave birth to two babies. Should I cry instead of smile? You didn't smile like this when I gave birth to a baby boy. He was smiling as if he had won $50,000. In fact, Finn would not be happy if he won $50,000 because he had no concept of money. You had another baby on the way just now. I was so worried about you that I couldn't be happy. You must be lying to me. I don't lie, especially not to you. Is that true? It's true. While the two of them were talking in low voices, the midwife asked, Dr. Jones, do you want to cut the umbilical cord for the baby yourself? No need. Finn rejected the offer without hesitation. If the brother didn't have it, the sister doesn't have to have it as well? No need. Finn smiled. I'm afraid that the lady will be jealous. Monica blushed. How could she be so petty? She just did not want to see Finn. Fine, she was petty. When she heard Finn say that he would not cut it, she was in such a good mood that she did not want Finn to leave her side for even a second. Upon hearing Finn's words, the doctors and nurses in the delivery room lowered their heads and smiled at how much Dr. Jones doted on his wife. How are you? How do you feel now? Finn shifted all his attention to Monica and asked her in a low voice. Never better. It feels as if I've pooped out a thousand years worth of sh asterisk t and my stomach has been emptied. Monica described exactly how she felt. The doctors and nurses in the delivery room were all amused by Monica's joy. It was rare to see such a fun pregnant woman. Finn, quick. Help me take a look. Has my stomach gone down? Monica asked excitedly. Finn could not help but laugh out loud. He said, you don't have to look. It's still the same. How is that possible? I've pushed two babies out. Finn was speechless. Did Monica think her children were really like sh asterisk t? The uterus has a certain recovery period, and it won't contract so quickly. If it contracts too quickly, you won't be able to take it. Monica was displeased because she thought she could regain her sexy figure after giving birth. She was sick and tired of the days of having a pregnant belly. Dr. Jones, do you want to hold your daughter? The nurse carried the baby girl over. She's heavier than her brother. No need. Finn said, you can take her out for the people outside to hold her. All right. The nurse did not ask further. After all, in Dr. Jones's eyes, his wife was the most important. What were sons and daughters for anyway? When the nurse opened the delivery room door and carried the second baby out, everyone immediately surrounded her. Is it over? Ruby asked excitedly. It's over. It's a girl. Really? Ruby could not contain her excitement. Is it really a girl? Yes, it's a pair of fraternal twins, the nurse quickly said. That's great. Finn kept saying that he couldn't tell the gender of the second baby, so we were all prepared for it to be a boy. However, this is a pleasant surprise. Come, let me hold you. Ruby's face was full of smiles. Aren't you carrying one in your arms? I'll carry this one, Gary quickly said. This is for you. Ruby happily handed the baby to Gary. Gary's face turned red. Didn't you say that I'm clumsy? That's why I don't want you to hurt the sister. Girls should be handled gently. Ruby said righteously. You're such a hypocrite. Do you want him or not? Ruby threatened. Gary had no choice but to hold the brother, whom they were fighting over just now. However, now that the sister was out, the brother was not as popular anymore, and it was really unfair. Ruby hugged the sister and simply could not bear to part with her. She said, Look, look, the sister is so pretty. Knox loved to join in the fun. Hence, he quickly leaned over to take a look, only to curse to himself, F asterisk CK. He thought she looked exactly like her brother. How was she pretty? She was wrinkled and red, like a little old man. However, Finn and Monica were not ugly either, so he could not understand why their children were so ugly. She's so cute. Jean quickly chimed in and gently caressed the sister's face, which was smooth and tender. Knox looked at Jean and secretly called her a hypocrite. Jean, who noticed Knox looking at her with disdain, said bluntly, you'll know when you have children in the future. My son will look handsome as a newborn. After all, he was handsome and suave. Jean looked at him as if he was an idiot and could not be bothered to waste her breath on him. However, Knox was not hurt because of Jean's gaze. On the contrary, he was wondering when could he have a son. By the way, how is Monica? Ruby suddenly thought of her daughter and quickly asked. She's fine. 
Dr. Jones has been accompanying her inside, so she's in good condition. It's just that after giving birth to two babies, she might be a little exhausted, but she would be fine after a nap. Okay, thank you. As we should. The nurse smiled and said, now that the two babies are out, which family member of the patient would want to come with me to give the babies their inoculations? Auntie and uncle, you guys can go ahead. We'll wait here for Monica to come out, Jean said. All right, we'll leave Monica to you and head over now. Okay. Jean nodded. Then, Gary and Ruby carried the two babies and left with the nurse. Not long after, Finn pushed Monica out in a wheelchair. She looked radiant and full of energy, and when she saw them waiting for her outside, she also looked pleased. Jean could tell from Monica's expression that the girl was showing off. Monica, how are you feeling? Sarah asked. I've never felt better in my life, Monica said excitedly. Do you know what it feels like to poop after nine months of constipation? The crowd was at a loss for words. The pleasure is indescribable, Monica said with a smile. Finn could not bear to listen to her anymore, so he said, let's go back to the ward first. Okay. With that, the group returned to the high-class ward, where the nurse and nanny were all ready. Since they had twins, they naturally hired twice the amount of people. Finn carried Monica from the wheelchair and placed her on the bed. The biggest advantage of natural birth was that after giving birth, she was free, unlike a C-section, where the pain only began after the baby was born. That was why Monica was in a very good state of mind and was not feeling weak. Jeannie, did you see the twins just now? It's a boy and a girl. Monica boasted. Yes, they both look like you. Jean nodded. At that moment, Monica was allowed to show off. Is that so? I didn't even notice their looks. It's true, Jean said with certainty. Then, they must be very handsome and beautiful. Monica was overjoyed. No, Knox suddenly interrupted. I was wondering why the babies looked so ugly, but it turns out they look like you. Knox, you be asterisk starred. Monica cursed angrily. Keep your voice down, Finn reminded her from the side. You're supposed to be resting now. You can't be as carefree as usual. Finn, Knox said our children are ugly, Monica said like a spoiled child. Finn glanced at Knox and said, it's okay. He's just jealous. After all, he's the only one without a child. Knox was furious. He finally understood why Monica called Finn a SC asterisk bag. It was because was really Finn asking for a beating. I don't have one either, Sarah interrupted. She did not want Shelly to feel awkward. After all, now that Shelly was dating Knox, teasing Knox would be equivalent to teasing Shelly, was it not? Besides, Shelly was not familiar with those people and would be shy. Aren't you dating Brandon? The sooner you get married, the sooner you'll have children, Finn said bluntly. What? Monica was so shocked that she almost jumped up from the bed. I told you to behave yourself. You need to rest. Finn pushed Monica down, forcing her to lie down. Finn, how did you know? Sarah blushed. She and Brandon had also happened by chance. The two of them slept together first before they started dating. However, none of them had made it public yet because they did not think their relationship was stable but they did expect Finn to expose them. I bumped into them by accident, Finn said indifferently. He did not seem to be interested in their relationship. On the contrary, Monica, who was lying on the bed, was very excited. When did you guys start dating? How did you guys start dating? Brandon, when did you hook up with my cousin? Didn't you say you liked me? When Monica blurted out the last sentence, Finn's expression changed. Brandon had yet to answer when Monica asked Sarah again, why are you always going after my men? Sarah blushed.